prolific author, a researcher, an incredible. If you don't know who Tom Horn is, then you've been living under a rock for the last uh, uh, decade, I'm sure. Uh, and of course, Steve Quill, the same way. Uh, Steve Quill, author, researcher. In fact, he just published a, he just uh, the, his book, uh, Exo, yeah, Xenogenesis. What am I saying? Exo. It's Xenogenesis. Uh, changing men into monsters. You know, I knew that, Tom. I did. Honest, I promise. I, I'm looking at the word, and it just came out wrong. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, that just came out, and i got to tell you, it, it's a wonderful read. Uh, with us, Mr. Horn, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. It's great to be on the show with you guys again. Well, I'll yeah, tell I mean, you, I, I, wait. Well, no, I just I didn't even know I was going to be in town, and and Steve had contacted me a couple of weeks ago and wanted to know if we could do a radio show, and I said no, I'm not going to be in town. And then things changed, and all of a sudden the, the opportunity was there. And who wouldn't want to be on the Hagman and Hagman show? Oh, well, I'm sure there are a few people, but uh, but thank you so much for <laughs> being for for being part of this. And Steve Quayle, uh, new book Xenogenesis: Changing Men into Monsters. Out. It's really required reading for the Hagman and Hagman uh, audience. I got to tell you, it's I think it's one of Steve's best works. I, I said that to him. I have read it and uh, reading it again. Some of the pictures in there are just just phenomenal. I can't believe it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Steve Quayle from SteveQuayle.com. Tom Horn from RaidersNewsUpdate.com. Both hard linked off of HomelandSecurityUS.com. Steve, welcome, and we're going to turn it over to you, sir. Well, it's good to be here with everybody, and I think Tom and I are, are, are at the point now where the things that we're concerned with, where we were used, where we used to be telling everybody to be watching for them in the future, now they're present in ver- its very ugly manifestation. And what we're going to talk about tonight is the basically the oldest lie in the world just uh, placed into a technological framework with a contempt for humanity that can only be uh, birthed from the bowels of hell. What we're talking about tonight, when we're talking about transhumanism, when we're talking about humanity plus, when we're talking about singularity, all the words we'll touch on, we're basically talking about a group of individuals, I believe, that are controlled by fallen angels and very evil and malevolent beings that basically says as a human being you're inferior in your current form you can become you can become a god without any need for changing your lifestyle just eat the forbidden fruit and you can enjoy eternal life with no need to believe in anything other than yourself and science well that's kind of it that's kind of and I'm going to use this word since the word trident is so uh strident t r i d e n t in, in the weeks that we've been watching everything with all of the Illuminati uh, signals, everyone's got to understand that a trident is basically a spear from uh, Neptune or Poseidon, depending on Greek or Roman mythology, and on the three tips are barbs to keep that which is speared or that which is caught from being able to flee. This is the greatest lie ever pe- perpetrated. And Tom sent me an email, and I'm going to turn it right over to Tom. And said, Steve, this is going to take the church, and these are my words, not his. I'll let him put it into his words. Because the bottom line, tonight we're going to start out with the bottom line. You know how I love to do that, Tom. (laughs) And tell people what they're in for, and then we'll give them all the evidence they need. Because the war that's coming in the uh, household of faith, in the literal households of the family, in the literal, uh, 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 I would say, the cities, the counties, the countries on the planet are going to be so mind-boggling that we're going to be in fully engaged, not just against earthly entities, but against supernatural entities. So, Tom, your major concern in, 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 in coming on tonight with me is, would you just spell it out what, after everything you've written to date, after everything you've seen come into play, even obviously the false prophet being... Uh, uh, quoted uh, ad nauseum, uh, where where are your major concerns? Because my major concern is the same as yours. If the Christians don't understand that they're going to be incorporated in this whole scheme of hell, they're going to be taken into it, and they're going to lose their souls. And I'm talking Christians now, and we're not going to get into predestination, all that stuff. But if people willingly side with the devil, they can't expect Jesus to bail them out. Share, Tom, if you would, lay it out. Yeah, hey, Steve, great to be on with you again, too. And, of course, uh, as so often has been the case, our 
uh, independent research seems to be tracking along the same lines again. Uh, we'll be releasing a documentary film that's actually taking us uh, over two years to produce this documentary. It's not one of those quick snap things that we're putting out real fast. We've traveled around the world. We've got all the world's leaders on all sides of the issues, really. We've got the, the leading transhumanists in the world that agreed to be on film. We've got the uh, theologians that have agreed to put this into a prophetic context. We've got members of the U.S. President's Council on Bioethics that are talking about it from a conservative and liberal um, bioethical point of view. But what all of this information – oh, and DARPA told us they were going to give us a sit-down, and then they pulled out at the last minute because I think they heard a show that you and I did, and it scared them, Steve. But <clears throat> that being that what it is, uh, all, all this information um, is pointing towards really the fulfillment – of Hugo de Garris's Artelect War. We've talked about that before, so I won't go into that tonight. And the thing that, and Hugo, by the way, is also in our documentary. But while we were doing the research for that film, here you were once again out there tracking uh, parallel to us. And I didn't even know you were writing this book uh, called, um, hey, I just received it today. It's called Xenogenesis, Changing Men into Monsters. And I'm really looking forward to uh, reading that. I, I scanned through it real quick today when I got back. Um, but but there is a war that is coming. The problem with people like uh, Hugo de Garris is um, that he doesn't put it into a spiritual context. He's an agnostic, and therefore, in my mind, though he's a super brilliant man, he's a terrific academic, but, you know, the wisdom of the world it misses those things that are the most eternally important, um, and that's part of what I guess greatly concerns me, that the church really is asleep uh, at the wheel. And if the church doesn't address the spiritual and supernatural aspects of this human enhancement era that we've already entered into, uh, if they're not addressing the issues, then they're they're going to be blindsided by what is coming. And I'm not talking about the institutional church. They're already going to be blindsided. I'm talking about true believers who, for whatever reason, haven't yet awakened to this imminent reality that we are standing on the we're standing on the very ledge edge about to fall over into a revolution that's going to dwarf the industrial revolution uh, in terms of human enhancement. We're going to uncover that tonight. How the transhumanist revolution, the Grin technologies, genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, how all of that is being employed now at breakneck pace. Experiments are happening in laboratories uh, around the world, but ultimately it's going to lead to a war. Hugo de Guerra sees it. Other people see it. Some of the transhumanists that we talk to see it, and, and we'll talk about um, why that is the case here um, in a moment, but I'll give you an example. Language is being um, very subtly crafted right now for the divide that is going to be engineered within society that ultimately is going to pit those who stand on the side of Antichrist against those who are the truly born-again element uh, on planet Earth. Uh, and you can see it in examples. For instance, just this week, Scientific American, I want to point people to this article, because it would be easy to overlook this article, but there is some very important subtle language in the article. Um, and so if you go to Scientific American, you'll find an article there on genetically modified rice. But why is this article important? It's because Scientific American plainly states that those who oppose genetic modification, now we're talking organisms, food, people, whatever, that they are guilty of murder and they have to be held accountable. They're literally calling for some type of legalese, if you will, to be created that will start holding accountable those who would stand in the way of a transhumanist progress. The article takes this case in point, genetically modified rice, the so-called golden rice, which I think you've written about before. Um, they say that it's been ready for over a decade. It has the pharmaceutical ability to cure a number of things, blindness, even death, they say, and that the delayed application of golden rice in India alone, they say, has cost 1.4 million life years just in the last decade. Now, now imagine that. They're claiming that 1.4 million people have died 
because of us who stand in the way of the acceptance of genetically modified uh, uh, rice because they, this genetically modified rice, they claim, will increase people's vitamin A deficiency, which then is going to cure blindness and extend uh, their lives and whatever. But I want to just—I don't want to get hung up on this. I just want to read this quick quote, which I was reading just before we went on the air. Here's what they say, quote, The majority of those who went blind or died because they did not have access to golden rice were children. These are real deaths, real disability, real suffering, not the phantom uh, fears about the human health effects of golden rice thrown around by opponents, none of which have held us to objective scientific scrutiny. That's their claim. It is absolutely fair to charge that opponents, uh, excuse me, charge that opposition to this particular application of genetically modified food has contributed to the deaths and injuries to millions of people, thus the opponents of golden rice who have caused this harm should be held accountable, end quote. So there you have one of many arguments that are being made today in which opponents of genetic modification, which is only one of the things we'll talk about tonight, but they're being classified as murderers uh, because they oppose genetic modification. But now, extrapolate that forward. You know as well as I do, that's exactly the same argument that's already being crafted by the proponents of human genetic modification. They're saying that re-engineering humans is going to lead to improved, even eternal lifespans, and that those that stand in the way are the enemies of humanity. So thus, Hugo de Garris's Artelect War Theorem, or better yet, I suspect, as I read it, Steve Quayle's Xenogenesis. A line is being drawn in the sand, and I cannot overemphasize to those who might be listening tonight, especially if they're a truly born-again believer, you have got to take the time to understand this situation. Situation, this phenomenon, because it is it is literally going to pit one side against the other, and not uh, before long. Uh, you know, what, I, wonder, I saw just, the. Uh, or, go, go ahead, ahead Steve. Well, uh, no, no, I saw, after I just, Tom or I speak, excuse me. There's a weird noise and there's a delay, so I don't mean to overtalk you. I'll be quiet, but when you're ready, hand it back to me. So, Tom, when you're done. I'll give it to Doug, and then when Doug's ready, he'll give it back to me. That way, I don't talk, but there is a weird sound and a delay. I don't know if you're hearing it. It sounds. Yeah, and there's nothing we can do about it. It's almost as if we've lost control. We apologize that. Um, But, but no, the um, uh, golden rice is extremely important. I just want to echo your your sentiments here. This is an article dated five days ago, March 15th of 2014, where, to me, this represents the actual religious aspect and the fervor of these genetically modified proponents. And I just wanted just to reaffirm this with our listeners. Um, They they, they kind of go at this with, well, look, uh, health problems linked to vitamin A deficiency. Uh, This could be cured, and of course, or this could be this could be taken care of, and, and you're right, Tom. Um, there is an awful lot of, uh, I mean, this is a fervent religious issue, uh, in addition to transhumanism and hu- humanism being a religious uh, or a religion by itself. Go ahead, Steve. That's all I wanted to say. Well, I think that everyone should put into perspective the explosion of technology. I can. I, I, I haven't done it in a timeline yet, Tom, but you could do it. You and I could probably detail it out at some point together. But the, as you see the whole fallen angel realm, I want to put something into perspective. The reason Tom Horn was led to write the Armand Gate, the reason Tom's been doing his investigation and I've been doing my investigation, whether it's on Stargates or Giants or Nephilim or, or the powers of hell manifesting in a form and at a time that they were bound from being able to act until now, the, the whole plot, plan, and scheme brings us to this point tonight. There is no uh, no more... Pertinent, no more uh, important subject, no more damning subject, no more relevant subject than what we're talking about. And I just want to state for the record, I don't know that I could do anything different than what I've done to this point. 
In other words, in xenogenesis, xenogenesis just means the addition of a, uh, of a third source of chromosomes outside of the normal male and female. Just even in this week, Tom, you saw all the stories about basically taking uh, stem cells from a male and, and changing the constituency of the stem cells and basically enabling people to produce their own clones, kind of like a genetic incest, okay? Uh, we'll call it geneticist. There we go. There's a new Steve word for tonight. But I think the, the, the thing that uh, people have got to understand is this. And I'm going to read from something that was given to me. And, ladies and gentlemen, this is in the book Xenogenesis. Doug was kind enough to give me his box of chocolates for the intro. And then a very dear friend of mine, Will B., uh, sent me notes that was were given to him. And, Tom, this is fascinating. You'll you'll be uh, uh, amazed at this by a very high-ranking member of the CIA who on his deathbed wanted to clear his conscience. I believe it was his, his attempt to have my friend be able to lead him to the Lord Jesus Christ when he came to the conclusion that all the technology, all of the developments, everything was leading to the point of dark, malevolent, evil spiritual forces being the guiding hand behind it. Now, here's what he wrote, and I'm, I'm going to read this, and I'm going to turn it right over to Tom, because this has got to be, in my opinion, the most important, the most important statements. These are some of the most important statements, but the to- and I'm trying to, I'm going too fast. The subject matter tonight is absolutely critical for every living human being, every Christian, every even every atheist, every agnostic, because if you don't understand what's going on in the realm of the supernatural, you are affected by it. Well, you don't even maybe uh, or necessarily acknowledge it. I'm quoting. This is from uh, my chapter, I think, uh, 16. Mankind has come to the point in history where he is technologically able to do most anything that he conceives of. With the explosion of the Internet and modes of travel and communications, with scientific breakthroughs and innovations, all guided, this is a CIA guy, high-ranking before he passed away, in some manner by dark forces. We stand at that place in time when the greater master plan of dark forces can be realized and acted upon. Most humans are not aware that the work has this greater purpose, and they willingly go about their research with blinders on. We reject God and his perfect order and replace it with the same reason that was used in Eden and with Enoch in an attempt by fallen angels to enact their final plan to overthrow God. Notice this, high-ranking, very high-ranking intelligence guy talking about fallen angels and their plan. A reward for this work is the praise of man, financial gain, and a higher standard of living which causes us to seek after this type of gain, the result being our focus on the things of man rather than things of God. And then quoting the scripture, thinking themselves wise, they became fools. Now listen to this, and we'll get into this later. As to the removal of the Alpha and the Omega, that's Jesus Christ, Langley was convinced, as I am, Will speaking, that the final chapter is about to be revealed. It's already been written in the book of Revelation that we're on the verge of witnessing the restraining walls between dimensions and the restraining power of the Holy Spirit being removed. This will not be accomplished by an assault on heaven, but by God's purposeful removal of the Holy Spirit and, 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 and or Michael, the, the archangel, and at this time humans will have made a conscious choice as to which side they will serve, God or darkness. So, Tom, it, this is a winnowing period in which the head knowledge of God and his purpose will be challenged as opposed to heart knowledge and relationship by an unimaginable time of violence and lawlessness. Now, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Go ahead, Tom. Well, absolutely, and let me... Let me say that at some point tonight, I want to talk about this coming war between Christian versus Christian. But because we've started this show out, and, and Steve always likes to get to the bottom line first and then work backwards, <laughs> let, let me talk about <laughs> yeah. what, what, one, of the, one of the deep aspects of the transhumanist vision, the human enhancement um, vision, includes this whole genetic alteration, this army this guy's talking about that's going to play a role in a, a basically a global Lucifer effect um, involving this exotic concept. And this is one that I know that whenever we talk about this, a lot of the people that even like us kind of really have a hard time wrapping their mind around believing that this is going to and is already unfolding uh, it, it, and ultimately is going to lead to the actual genetic alteration of future humans 
including religious types, that are going to comprise this soulless uh, coming army of the Antichrist. I mean, it's really a spooky thought, but but it's one that's commanding more and more consideration from thoughtful prophecy expositors, I think, thanks to a, a great deal of research by Steve Quayle, who was ahead of all of the rest of us. Um, but it also makes a great deal of sense. In other words, when you look at the book of Revelation and how it describes the complete lack of consciousness when it comes to the the, the slaughter the wholesale slaughter of people who claim to be Christians, but it's going to be happening uh, around the world and on the side of the Antichrist is also going to be the world's largest religious system. Believers who are going to be consenting uh, to the death of these other people who, um, well, at the end of the day, they're the born again. They're, they're, their souls are saw under the altar of God in uh, heaven. Um, but when you want, when you ask yourself the question, how in the world in modern society could you have so many people willing to consent to the death of individuals, um, uh, uh, born-again believers, maybe they act with such inhumanity because, well, they're not altogether human any longer. And, and no matter how exotic that may sound, it must be uh, considered. Steve probably takes considerable time in his book, Xenogenesis. Uh, Chris Putnam and I took considerable time in the book, Exo Vaticana, to outline the historical activity of the ancient watchers, the fallen angels, and their genetic creation known as the Nephilim, as well as the resemblance of that activity with modern transhumanist goals involving genetic modification of species, which Steve mentioned a moment ago. It's been in the news uh, uh, this week. Uh, uh, the headline was over there at Raiders News concerning one of the world's leading bioethics journals, the Journal of Medical Ethics. It doesn't get more respectable, saying, get ready, world, for all kinds of genetically engineered people, individuals that can mate with themselves, multiplex parenting, gay gaticas, one of the prophecies that Steve and I made. So the genie's out of the bottle, and it's just now slowly kind of becoming uh, public knowledge. Um, but here's something I want to add to this. There's In the most cutting-edge science right now, um, scientists, believe it or not, increasingly believe that genetics play a, a, a role in human and animal behavior more so than what was previously believed, and that there could be a kind of evil genetic combination. And I'm saying all this because we're talking now about how genetics are going to play a role in this coming army of the Antichrist that is going to be one of those instruments that pits Christians against uh, Christians. But scientists are talking now about a combination that leads to lower inhibitions involving uh, criminal activity and murder. There's an article I would tell people to go and Google. Um, it was written for the Florida State University. It's actually titled The Evil Gene, and it was written by a guy by the name of Frank Stevenson, who is working with the university there as well as the University of Connecticut, where these scientists are analyzing the DNA of spree killers, of um, serial killers. But the very first line in Stevenson's paper suggests what the professors are looking for when it asks, and this is the headline, quote, could a monster be swimming in the human gene pool, end quote. And if you read the article, you'll find out the good researcher approaches this study not the way we would. He approaches it from a Darwinian foundation. And uh, I have a quote right in front of me that I'll just read to you. Let me read this. He says, in ascending the evolutionary ladder, humans obviously fail to inherit from their hairy forebears inhibitions against using lethal force against members of their own species, the bizarre ghoul factor of sadistic psychopaths like Ted Bundy aside, humans' historic willingness to slaughter each other wholesale in war and genocide offers compelling evidence to some scientists, now listen to this, that in the genome of some humans lies a fully armed biochemical code for the gamut of aggression from kicking the dog to killing the wife, end quote. Now, why is that important? Because in, in tandem with Stevenson's 
um, alternate worldview speculation about an evil biochemical code. Um, in recent years, considerable advances in DNA research with one of the more popular fields actually called behavioral epigenetics. Have you guys heard that term? Behavior epigenetics? Um, our, our, our biologist yeah, friend I mean, Sharon, be- yeah, Sharon Gilbert tells me that that's now the darling of genetic studies. But the point about it is, it is it's a new area that seeks to examine and understand the role that genetics might play in shaping animal and human behavior, their cognition, their personality, their mental health, so that by altering their genetics, in essence, you alter their soul. What is the soul? I mean, both theologians and philosophers, if you ask what is the soul, it is not just that essence of yourself that will live on to eternity, but it's what molds behavior, cognition, personality, and so on. But if you can if you can alter all of those through changing your genetics, then Steve, this goes back to stuff you were writing about many years ago. That by altering future humans genetically, you're 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 either completely changing what we would think of as soul, or they no longer have soul. Period. They might have a philosophical concept of soul, a consciousness, but not as it was made uh, in. Uh, in in the uh, divine order, not as God made it. And epigenetics is something that now they're finding is probably real because they're studying this even all the way down to uh, the womb, and they're finding embryos can be uh, changed, chemical changes can be brought on by the mother's activity that affect the genetic makeup. Now, we know that in real simple things, like if a mother drinks alcohol, right, it can alter and change, it might lead to various kinds of illnesses and disease. So we know that the mother's behavior can affect the child's uh, genetic makeup. But can it also uh, change the future behavior of that child? And that's where it starts getting interesting, and that's what they're trying to find out, these modifications. Can they become heritable? Can they be passed from one generation to uh, the next? And that's what has some of these scientists wondering if evil genetics, as this one guy calls it, but what they mean is a toxic combination of specific genes, can that be linked to aggression, antisocial behavior in succeeding generations of some, some families? Well, if so, then that raises an intriguing question. Well, actually, it raises two questions. One, which we won't talk about now because it opened a can of worms that has to do with bloodlines. But a second question that I will pose regarding this potential for a blueprint, if you will, a specific genetic combination that could exist in which individuals can be programmed or reprogrammed to act in defiance of normal human conscientiousness or having a soul as we were made to have. That definitely does appear to have been the estate of those Nephilim, where ancient records depict them as bloodthirsty, violent enemies of God's people. They never once had a conflict of consciousness. Isn't it interesting that though their creators, the Watchers, in the book of Enoch, they go back to God and they plead for the forgiveness? But have you noticed there's no records anywhere that say that any of the Nephilim themselves, none of them ever went to God. Their parentage did, but they didn't. There was just something entirely different about them. They had no conflict of consciousness when they were killing, when they were slaughtering. Uh, They never asked for forgiveness for their brutality. Genetically, they were engineered with a specific cellular combination by powerful fallen angels. These more remarkable constructs were not made in the image of God. They appear to have been specifically designed for demonic inhabitation. But the question is, did the Nephilim also represent a repeatable, a repeatable dark molecular model? That's the way Tom Horn would phrase exactly the same question that the University of Connecticut uh, and uh, 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 the Florida State University are asking now. When they're when they're asking, is there a bio an evil biochemical? code that can be tracked down and connected to the guy that it becomes a serial killer. But in theology, we, if, we, if we look at it through the prism of what happened with the Nephilim, we would say, is there a repeatable dark molecular code? Well, Jesus said that the end times was going to witness a return to the activity 
that happened when the Nephilim first walked the earth. And today, for the first time since those days, uh, Steve Quayle can write a book called Xenogenesis because we have intentionally set out to genetically modify plants, to genetically modify animals, and now to genetically modify humans, like the peer-reviewed Journal of Medical Ethics reported this week when it said get ready for all kinds of genetically modified humans, because it is going to happen. It's absolutely going to be a constitutionally defended, protected right. The, the, the largest uh, think tanks in the world right now, are writing the legalese that is going to change the Constitution to allow for the personhood of human non-humans. But back to my question, um, it, Jesus said that it was going to happen. Uh, so is it possible we've entered a reprise of the days of Noah in which a genetic hazard is going to be unleashed, result, resulting in a global pandemic? Let's call it a Nephilim virus. Well, I think it's more than possible. And I think it might be very much connected to those verses in Scripture that describe that war in which people are so brutally disposed of in such inhumane ways. Steve, this Doug. Steve, this this cuts this cuts right to the uh, chase with with what what we're talking about, or we talked about before about that uh, print, uh, the. Uh, well, parasite, if you will, into the uh, DNA is uh, right. Okay, uh, I just want to. Throw Tom, that in. Tom hasn't had. Yeah, Tom, you haven't had a chance yet because you just got it today. But in the very first chapter of my book, Xenogenesis, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, from all the people, especially Sheila Zelinsky was allowed to read it first. Doug, uh, you know, read it very quickly. Uh, he got one of the first ones I got. But the thing is, is that I, I'm, I really have sensed. And I'm saying this and in, in, in with a total uh, thanksgiving to all the intercessors out there, such a directed, forceful urging to write this. Now, I, I want to use a couple terms. Just uh, Tom and I, we don't argue, but he uses the word Nephilim. Let me share how I, I use this, and I want to use the word Rephaim. Rephaim was uh, the, the dead, the D-E-A-D. Uh, is eight places in the Old Testament it talks about the dead. So here's how I see it. I can say this, that those who issued from the Nephilim, as they are their father's sons. I believe the demon seed, Tom, is what, what you will read about in the box of chocolates given to Doug Hagman, which is, and I told Doug this, and I've said it on the radio program, it is the singular most important revelation just like the singular most uh, important revelation I got on Stargates is when you and I spoke a number of years ago, and just the very gates of hell would not prevail. That key unlocked a whole understanding of me that evidently the Lord wanted to give me at that time. The box of chocolates, which is in chapter 1 of Xenogenesis, I could never understand Jesus' words where there's weeping in hell, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth where the worm dieth not. The case is made that in the box of chocolates, that's just the title of it, the seed of the serpent in sin, that when we sin and through original sin, we have that serpentine structure in our DNA. And, you know, all the scripture talks about Jesus being the second Adam, that if any man be in Christ Jesus, behold, old things have passed away, new th we become new creations. Well, what Doug laid out in that, and I'm trying to witch your whistle, Tom, and it's not fair to t ask you to re you know, respond to it, but uh, this is building up to where I need to go. What you just said, in the whole epigenetic argument, the scripture, we could have told him that years ago, just as Christians. First Kings 14.22, and Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. We're told in scripture that the father's sins are what? Visited under the second and third generation? How can that be unless it's genetic? So in the answer in Scripture, I love the Scripture, because there's nothing that God has not covered from the beginning that will be affecting us in the end. Having said that, Jesus said there's weeping and gnashing teeth where the worm dieth not. Well, the thing that's fascinating to me is, is that we become new creations in Christ Jesus, and that blood of Jesus, now this is critical, we don't have to get in the bloodlines, but we have a... We have the resurrection blood of Jesus in us. The question now I'm going to pose to you, Tom, 
is how do you see this playing out? Boy, talk about putting you on the spot. How do you see this playing out between the Christians who believe maybe intellectual salvation? They, they have not yet had a transformational new birth. They, they only acknowledge their intellectual acknowledging of God. Well, James took care of that when he said, you know, you believe in God? Well, you do well. The devils also believe in God. How do you see that playing out? Because we can jump into that right now. Well, I have. I'm only trying to read between the lines because I haven't read your book. I don't know the box of chocolates. I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about. I would just simply say this: it's very possible that there is something in our fallen human genetic makeup that could be awakened, or that can be crucified by new birth. Um, and whether or not that is true, you either have to be crucified by new birth and born again in order to make it into heaven, or you're going to go to hell anyway. So kind of the end result (laughs) really is the same thing. But it does add to the mystery of something about human nature. If we get time tonight, we should talk about the the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Milgram Experiment and some of these secular experiments that illustrate something very, very dark in almost all humans who couldn't – they couldn't possibly believe that – about themselves, and yet redundant military experiments uh, and a government-paid experiment, experiments and university experiments have illustrated that there is something very dark. Well, doesn't the Bible tell us that the heart is deceitfully wicked? It's, I mean, there is something very dark in humanity. Now, if that also is part of our genetic constitution that must be crucified, the, 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 the fallen man, uh, which Paul said has to be done on a daily basis. Those things that I would, I do not, and what I would not do, I do. Who can save me from, you know, this wretched person that I am, I am. I need saved from this wretched person that I am. Now, through epigenetics, we're starting to find out that that wretched person that we are is also part of our genetic makeup. It's what distinctively separates us from the animal kingdom. It's why we're not a dog, a horse, or act like another animal, because we are a fallen human. Now, there are numerous scenarios that are all based on real science that envision an event that could, in effect, awaken that dark side of humanity, modify epigenetics worldwide, and thus, hypothetically, the mind, the makeup, the soul or the lack of the soul, of all of those except those who would be protected by God. And isn't it interesting during the Great Tribulation that God puts a seal on those who belong to him so that the darkness, the the plagues, things that are going to affect genetics cannot touch them. So in theory, this might mean that suddenly, effectively, something could be unleashed that would diminish the ability of the sufferers to feel empathy toward others. Now, if that has some of the listeners thinking I've been watching too many zombie flicks, I'm reminded of the the Hollywood film starring Will Smith, I Am Legend. Uh, And here you have a movie that opens with a scientist announcing that the cure to cancer has been reached by using a genetically engineered chimeric vaccine that blends animal and human genetics. Uh, We already now have uh, an assault on God's creative genius. And if you've seen the film, you know that the cure results in this human form of rabies that infects and takes over people's brains and turns them into these zombie-like monsters that wipe out most life on Earth. But that is an epidemiological possibility Given the the scenario, it's based on real science. Now, I read just recently, and I made a lot of notes about this I won't go into, but Jonathan D. Denman, who is a Ph.D., he's a professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Molecular Genetics at the University of Maryland, and people can Google and read his research. He says that a zombie virus, what we might call an ephilim virus, but a zombie virus, he said it almost exists right now. And he says, as a matter of fact, it could be engineered to fully occur using the very element from Will Smith's epic, rabies. Here's just one short quote. Infection, he says, is nearly 100% lethal, i.e. it turns you into the walking 
dead for a while at least, and it causes you to change your behavior by reprogramming you to bite other people in order to spread the infection, end quote. There is another doctor, uh, Dr. Samantha Price. She's a registered biomedical scientist and research information coordinator for the United Kingdom. And um, here's what she says. Rabies, as they are known today, would only need to be slightly mutated, something that could be engineered or occur naturally, to facilitate, now here's my words, an end times army of soulless killers. And it is actually, back to the quote now, the most likely to mutate into something that would be similar to a zombie virus. So here we have real science, real scientists telling us that within the genetic constitution of humanity is the makeup that only needs the right trigger, the right event, the right mutagenic effect, the right something that would uh, cause people. And this could happen on a very, very large scale to act kind of something like some of the zombie flicks that you've seen out there. Now, there are those who also believe that the Bible itself describes this zombie-like monstrosity, these persons at the end of time as part of the armies of the Antichrist. For instance, Zechariah 14.12. We've often talked about this as you know radiological contamination or nuclear war, but let it just say what it says without trying to interpret it based on what somebody might have said 20 years ago. Just listen to what it says. Zechariah 14, 12. This, is the, this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. So now we're talking about this end times war. Their flesh will rot while they are standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. End quote. So the way we're having this conversation tonight could put a whole new spin on this old prophecy because zombies of course you know these are they're reanimated but they're also in the process of putrefaction their tongues are rotting in their mouth their skin's rotting while they stand and now we have professors at the department of cell biology and molecular genetics at the university of maryland we've got biochemical scientists and researchers uh, for the United Kingdom telling us that we are only one minor click away from intentionally tweaking rabies so that you would literally have the fulfillment of Zechariah 14.12 and you've got these people that are part of the armies of Antichrist that are literally, I mean, they're dying, they're rotting, it's crazy, right? Um, the, uh, Revelation. 9.6 tells us that in the tribulation, what? Men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. What in the world is it talking about? So I don't want to go too far with this whole zombie thing, but I'm saying that there are scriptural reasons, and there are modern sciences that are converging at this moment in history because we are now doing what the Watchers did. We are tinkering with God's creation. We are blending animal and human genetics as well as synthetic organisms. We are messing with creation on, on, on a full, large, uh, uh, monstrous, you know, corporate scale around the world, and we don't know what the effects of these things are going uh, to have on us, um, and then you've got what? You've got the United States intelligence, military communities. We've talked about that before, the Jasons, warning that human enhancement involving genetic alteration, either by design, accident, or bioweapon, represents a potential existential risk. In other words, it could lead to the end of all living things on Earth. I still say, and I, I give this away anytime people email me, I have my staff give this away. There is a, and, and we're only allowed to read the summary because that's all that was ever made available to the public. But a year ago or a year and a half ago, whenever it was, uh, and the Jasons put out their DOD, um, uh, the summary of a larger study called the $100 Genome Implications for the DOD. But it, in it, they're talking about how rapid advances in DNA sequencing now and related technologies, it's not only ushering in an era of uh, precipitous genomics information and sciences, but a time when genotype and phenotypes are going to experience unpredictable deviations. Um, to put that in layman's term, an organism 
whether you're talking about, you know, just a, a tiny microscopic living thing or you're talking about, you know, an animal or a human, um, it, it gets its genotype, its genetic blueprint from its parents. So two humans give birth to another human. And its phenotype is the observable characteristics, the way it looks, the way it walks, the way it talks, the way it behaves. But what these policy advisors to the Department of Defense uh, in Washington are warning is that, first of all, we have to get involved in the human genetic revolution because our enemies are already doing it. But secondly, we have to know that as we start changing nature's genetic balance, then we have to expect that they're going to manifest revisions in their phenotype, in the way they walk, in the way they talk. They're going to walk different. They're going to think different. They're going to act different. Maybe this is that biochemical code. We're going to unleash some kind of a plague as a result of tinkering with God's creation that is going to create people that will appear for all intents and purposes to be soulless. They'll literally be automatons ready to be part of the armies of the Antichrist. I'm sorry if I'm dominating the conversation here. No. Not at all, and and I think it's critical that people understand. Now, Doug, you want to say something? I'll be quiet. No, uh, well, you know what? I, I've got a question, uh, I, and, and I certainly do would like to get into the uh, uh, Milgram experiments uh, of obedience because I think that, that after you know the top of the hour. But I got a question to uh, uh, to Tom and to you, Steve. Um, uh, consciousness. You know, it, it seems like everybody or these experiments are um, uh, really done with the idea of, of trying to ex- expand or extend endlessly human life. Um, one of the things I read in Xenogenesis and Steve Quayle's book, folks, uh, you got to grab a hold of that copy of that, uh, it, it, where uh, uh, Stephen Hawking is talking about downloading all of your thoughts and, and what have you into a computer for it, for really eternal life. My question is this. Does consciousness reside outside of the human body? Tom Horn, does it? Well, I think it... I think a kind of synthetic consciousness uh, in the near future as a result of the technological singularity could. You know, that new movie's out there now called Transcendence. And it and it plays off that very question, you know, so could something live on? Of course, in the movie, and I haven't seen the movie Transcendence. I don't think it's even released yet. But I think the, the idea behind it is that you've got one of the world's leaders and um, uh, well, I'm not sure what he's a leader. He's a, he's a scientist. He's a transhumanist. Uh, but the idea that he could extend his consciousness into upload it into a synthetic system, a computerized system, brain machine interfacing, all that, and he dies. And but before he dies, he uploads his consciousness, and it comes alive, and it becomes uh, a, a, a super entity. Um, millions of times, maybe trillions of times, more powerful than all of the Einsteins ever combined. And then I think the way the the plot is going to play out is then, of course, it becomes self-protective. And it sees humans as a threat, and now it's going to set out to destroy all humanity. Um, People should know that while that is a a sci-fi concept today, it is really on the mind of an awful lot of people who are working towards the technological singularity and some of the some of the greatest transhumanists that are actually eagerly eagerly anticipating the day when they will be able to upload their consciousness into a synthetic system and also to create uh, different bodies that they can download into so that they can walk around in a different body that's got some you know computer connected system that allows them to do that, but they have that fear that uh 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 you know that the moment a a synthetic mind comes online it could be uh only hours before humanity is obliterated and uh and again i mean hugo de garris of course wrote a whole book on that the the artelect war uh nick bostrom who is an oxford university professor and he's very much a pro transhumanist but he too has written about the existential threat as a result of technological singularity but all of that is based on that one question Uh, are we going to be able to upload our minds into a synthetic system so that the real us the part of us that outlives this shell that we're walking around in right now could live on into eternity um 
and so I would have to I would have to say I think that you know from a from a purely scientific point of view I think it's possible I think there is going to be a technological singularity but I don't happen to think it's going to lead to the utopian world that some transhumanists are hoping for. Okay, um, yeah, I would this answer. And, and oh, and, and let me add one other thing. Purely from a Christian ethos, I would not say that that is the soul that was given to us by God. I think that we we too are going to experience a singularity, but it's not going to be the one Ray Kurzweil comes up with. Gotcha. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, I think everyone needs to go back about a decade, and I remember breaking this story, and it was maybe 10, 12 years ago, but it was on British Telecom creating a chip that would basically synthesize and capture the consciousness. Guess what it was called, Doug? The soul catcher chip. Do you remember that, Tom? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The soul catcher chip. So I would answer it this way, too. Never in the history of anybody who wants to argue with prophecy being fulfilled has it been possible to kill everybody and bring about the total end of man, so much so that Jesus dealt with that right out of the start. He said, except the days be shortened, there would be no flesh, that's human beings, left alive. Yet for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now Jesus is absolutely, I believe, that was the most cool, amazing, wonderful time lock that, that amongst all the rest, but at this point for this conversation, to give us a heads up. The contempt, here's what we've got to understand. The contempt that Satan possesses and the fallen angels and the demons and the book of Enoch and the book of uh, giants on my website, stevequail.com. Actually, it's on genesis6giants.com. Those two documents say that demons are the disembodied spirits of giants. They are not fallen angels. I want to make that clear. Demons seek to express themselves. Every single cell tower you all see, every single building that's being built into the uh, heights of heaven, it's a return to a reverse Babylon. They're reversing Babylon. If somebody wants to do a quick search for me before the night's over and take the height of the 12 tallest buildings, add them together in feet for me, please give me the square root and the cube root. I'm going to show you something. And, Tom, this just came to me tonight, and I believe it comes in with David Flynn's. I've never thought about this statement before praying about tonight. To take the heights of those buildings, what I'm going to show you is this. There is a concerted effort with every cell tower, and don't kid yourself. I have done the documentation, and and I'm just saying this point blank. You can argue, you can say, I'm crazy, Horn's crazy, or whatever you want to say, but the science backs us up, even to U.S. patent numbers, and I'll give you the patent number right now, 5159703, silent subliminal uh, presentation of information. And so what I'm telling you right now, you are being subliminally uh, bombarded with infrasound and other forms of electromagnetic radiation that the standard scientific community is not privy to. You are also being exposed to chemical, to neurochemical and electromagnetic attenuation of diseases and viruses through the chemtrails. The chemtrails themselves are destroying the visible light spectrum. And, and we'll go into that in the second chapter when I have a few minutes to explain that. But, when, uh, Tom, is it not beyond everybody's uh, uh, grasp immediately? What's the movie that's garnering the most uh, amount of talk all over, even to the point where the Pope won't give Russell Crowe an endorsement? It's the days of Noah. Has everybody been following that? The words of Jesus in Matthew 24 are amazing to me. And, and see, I don't make any uh, apologies, nor does Tom, for the words of Jesus, because Jesus is the only one telling you how it's going to play out. So I'm told that just as in the days of Noah, and just as in the days of Nimrod, and all of the fallen angels, and all of their spawn, S-P-A-W-N, and you better not yawn about the spawn, because you're seeing them influencing, you're seeing now the particulate matter and the electromagnetic 
uh, attenuation of the realm with all of the different transmitters, the harp-like devices, the scalar weaponry, the scalar transmitters. By the way, the International Space Station, even the Russians in 1999, posted a massive paper on it. Does the International Space Station possess a weapon to basically be able to nullify the entire world's brainwave pattern? Those are my words, okay? So, you know, when you think of all this stuff as being, you know, quote-unquote conspiracy, you're living the total exposure of the Word of God when he said before the end comes, he's going, there's nothing that's been hidden that's not going to be revealed. That goes from some pretty dark creatures, and I concur with Tom's uh, discussion on zombies. The rabies virus has already been genetically altered, but beyond just even the classic view of genetic manipulation and and alteration there is the electromagnetic attenuation of diseases the russians uh perfected it the chinese wrote papers on it and so ladies and gentlemen we are in a frequency war and i'll make this blunt and simple you either get tuned in to redemption or you get thrust into hell and I'm talking about a physical hell on earth before a literal hell in eternity. Everything that mankind does, this is told to me by a multi-star general in special operations, everything, 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 and the search for antiquities, artifacts, archaeological uh, places, and, and it all centers around looking for the weapons of the ancients because these people literally believe they're going to make war on God. The fallen angels believe that by uh, getting mankind to accommodate them and to join forces with them, that that which God gave to man will ultimately be given back to the fallen angels or in conjunction with fallen man. So they basically uh, do a tag team run against Jesus and God. Let me tell you where that's going to end, in total failure, and they go into the lake of fire. But what most people are missing on this is what Tom and I are talking about. There are multiple PhDs by the hundreds. That's no exaggeration. Detailed in his works, detailed in my works. And this is what they want. They want the end of mankind. They want the human plus. They want an entirely different organism slash robotic cyborg. They want a being that is so devoid of all that which has made mankind wonderful, great, the creativity, the love. You know what's interesting, Tom? The word love, I do not see it except in the sexual connotation, and I wrote about that 15 years ago in Genetic Armageddon, that this was going to be one of the funding sources and the premier funding sources for all of the human enhancement. And I literally quote in my book, well, I won't go into detail, but I quote the guys what they've got planned. And just imagine an octopus on Viagra and the uh, accommodating orifices. That's the only way I can put it. You think I'm, uh, you know, I'm making this stuff up? These are the rantings of demonically controlled, demonically empowered, supernaturally energized entities that hate mankind and are doing everything within their power by willing stooges to bring about the end of humanity. Is that pretty blunt, Tom? Well, it's absolutely blunt, but look, anybody, Steve, listening to you, if they go out there right now and do any kind of Google searches, look up the top stories that are related to the human, the coming human enhancement era, the tech singularity, all the rest of it, what's one of the top things? If it's not the number one story, it's going to be in the top ten stories, and that is uh, sex with robots, sex with transhumanism in the future, and what it's going to be like. I mean, yeah, so there is, there is of course, that aspect, um, but... You don't even have to be a transhumanist to understand how that the dark side has perverted God's plan for man and woman. I mean, it's it, there was a news story that Donna ran at Raiders. I just caught the headline. I didn't read the article. But it was talking about, uh, you know, how so many Christian women today are hooked on pornography and men are hooked on. So this, is, this has always been, this has always been central to um, one of the instruments of the dark side to sideline God's people from being uh, actively involved in what God wants them to do, but also having a healthy, as God intended, uh, sexual relationship with their wife or their husband, 
Uh, and part of that is for the purposes of procreation, but I'm not just a Catholic in my theology there. I think part of it is also for pleasure, but within the context of marriage. And to pervert that has was started with the Watchers, the, the whole idea that fallen angels are going to mate with women. And uh, uh, even the whole porn industry's fascination with size and things like that uh, is it comes directly out of what was happening with the Watchers. That's I, we can't really talk about it on radio, and we can't show people the pictures of it. But it's a it's a it's chronicled, uh, factual uh, aspect of what was going on between the giants and the women, and the women who wanted to mate with giants, and they judged the size of the male anatomy. Uh, uh, to be indicative of their divinity, and they wanted to give birth to the gods. So it's, it was then, it is today, and interestingly, it's another one of those things that makes you think that transhumanism, once again, is um, at least in part you know, um, a repeat of what the Watchers were doing, because when, when you look at what you were talking about, Steve, there is that connection to... Uh, having sex with these various kinds of creatures and robots and whatever that are going to be created in the future. Very well said, Mr. Horn. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. We're up against the top of the hour break on this Thursday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report with our very special guest, Tom Horn and Steve Quayle. We'll be right back after these short messages. Stay with us. was originally created and uploaded to YouTube by the Hagman and Hagman channel. To view the full show archives, please visit youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Hagman and Hagman. Folks, what a great program. I'll tell you, two two of my favorite people, um, brother Steve Quayle, stevequayle.com, Tom Horn, uh, the Raiders News Update. If you, in fact, uh, right off of homelandsecurityus.com is a direct link to both stevequail.com and raidersnewsupdate.com. By the way, uh, check out Raiders News Update. They've got a lot of very interesting package deals for books. Of course, if you don't have it, Exo Vaticana, Petrus Romanus, and also, and I've got a copy of this, Earth's Earliest Ages a reprint from uh, a book that's, uh, what, 100 plus years old, uh, a very interesting uh, book itself. And, of course, Steve Quayle, his new book, Xenogenesis, it, it's out. Folks, the pictures in this book are just absolutely stunning. And, I mean, when I say stunning, I really thought, um, uh, for example, pictures from the compliments of DARPA that, to me, would just be in someone's imagination are included in this book, which it, you just, it'll blow your mind. It'll, yeah. it, it'll just... Re- I can't wait to see it. You know, I haven't ordered one yet, and you're hogging the other one, so. Uh. Well, I'm, in, so I'm, on my, I'm on my second uh, read here. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, the other thing, too, uh, and, and Exo Vatican and Petrus Romanus, great books. But look, uh, folks, two things I want to mention before you turn back over to uh, Steve and Tom. Two things here. A number, well, three things. Number one, the Whitestone Conference. Folks, if you haven't. Uh, checked it out, ordered it, ordered your tickets or places for it, please do so as soon as possible. The interest is ramping up tremendously for the three days in Montana and Bozeman. We're going to be there May 30th, 31st, and June 1st, uh, 1st, 2014. Speakers, uh, Steve Quayle, Russ Dizdar, Dr. Greg Evenson, and Pastor David Langford, and also Pastor John Kyle as well. Can't forget him. And the other things. Uh, tomorrow, Augusto Perez and Brother Marcus, and Tuesday, the 25th of March, next Tuesday, from sunny Orlando, uh, we're going to be honored to have Steve Quayle and V, the guerrilla economist, on our show. The way I'll tell you, it's going to be a fantastic program at that point. Uh, with that said, Steve, we're going to turn it back to you to moderate. Well, I want to share with everyone, one of the things that's interesting is what's taking place in South America right now. Uh, Tom and I have been talking about genetic engineering, writing concurrently, paralleling all of our research. And, Doug, in the last 30 days, there's been 90 earthquakes in the Peru-Chile area. And in the Paracas, Paracas had a, a very big one. That's where the skulls were found with the hair and the... I want to just tell everybody, those aren't skulls from normal entities or humans. The DNA is not even human. What I am proposing is something's getting ready, Tom. I don't think it's the Aramon Gate 
per, per se, but I believe the gates are opening in South America. If you understand the history of giants, what the Spanish conquistadors encountered, the written history, the written annals, it's like all hell from beneath is being moved to make way for this onslaught. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to be able to get a Spanish website up for Genesis 6 Giants. And, Tom, one of the things that I'm finding, because I have a uh, Timothy, the, the editor of the Spanish website, uh, I, I won't even attempt to. Uh, it's on my website. Go to stevequail.com. But the South American, uh, if, if you will, the appearances of giants, of, of UFOs, there seems to be a plethora of, of amazing events taking place that, quite candidly, the U.S. press isn't uh, picking up. Now, this thing has got, it's in Spanish, obviously, and it's got interviews, it's got documentaries, and it's, it's, it's got uh, so many, uh, like I say, past, present, and future. It contains a wide variety of subjects ranging from fallen angels, giants, aliens, megaliths, and one of the ladies we just brought on, Monica, is from Argentina. So these are people that know their language. Tim actually lived in the jungles of Peru. He's got an amazing testimony, and I'll probably bring him on sometime, Doug, to let him share his testimony. But we've got people now making contact, Tom, Doug, and Joe, from uh, different parts of the world that are predominantly Spanish-speaking. And when I hear from Tim and he gives me the feedback of what's going on, it's absolutely astonishing to me. So again, ladies and gentlemen, you can go if you uh, have uh, Spanish-speaking uh, friends, Latinos who maybe not are, are not good with English yet. It's an amazing website. It's Genesis 6 Giants. The interviews that are coming from some of the leading pastors who get it in South America, Mexico, will be overwhelming. Saying all that, this is the time this stuff must be described. This is the time this stuff must be talked about. Both Tom and I are absolutely convinced. Now, look at this. I write a book. He doesn't know about it. He's doing a movie, and I actually called it a book until he set me straight. And so God's using multiple witnesses. We're not the only two, but we're the two guys that seem to get the blessing of taking the most flack at first. And pretty soon all the guys that come after us and uh, basically forget where they heard it in the first place or, you know, they start out mocking us and they say, hmm, this literally happened to me the other day, Tom. And then they say, well, I guess there is something to it. Yeah, is there something to it. It's called your eternal soul. It's called the war on the saints. It's called the war between the saints. So, Tom, where would you like to go at this point? Do you want to go? Well, do you think yeah. you could? Yeah, yeah, let me just uh, let me let me just pick up and and go with some of what you're already saying. Uh, I I already before we went to the break, you had brought up the Raphaim, and I thought at some point tonight it'd be interesting to say a few things about that and say a few things about the uh, all these skulls that they're finding, and now they're getting DNA evidence that these things are not human whatsoever. Um, and uh, now there seems to be a kind of awakening over there. And as you know, Steve, um, the opening of portals and the awakening of the giants. This is prophesied. I believe this. If people don't want to believe it, I don't care, but it's in Scripture, and it's also in other ancient religious texts, some of which were appreciated by those followers of Jesus Christ, such as the Book of Enoch. The, it was prophesied that, that when Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, parallel prophecies tell us that this time would come when there would be an awakening of these giants. And I want to say something about that, but um, uh, Doug... When we came back from the break, you mentioned uh, that people should go to Raiders News Update. They should get a copy of Exo Vaticana. Um, uh, Chris Putnam and I, we did significant research, and that's become a best-selling book, Exo Vaticana. It goes into all kinds of stuff, but it also goes into a great deal of detail about genetically altered humans. And in fact, before the recent hoopla over these engineered three parent babies was reported the last couple of weeks anybody who's yet read ex of knows we documented the first cases of the germline level altered humans that are now in their teens so we were once again steve we were so far ahead of the secular news reporting on this but anyway they've been around for a while there's far more that we could talk about maybe we'll get to it tonight uh, we provided documents where, according to Britain's top medical advisory committee, there's all kinds of human chimera uh, animal experiments going on right now, including fully grown specimens that can even procreate across human-animal barriers 
happening in laboratories around the world now, they suspect. And this is the top scientific body out of the U.K. And if somebody wants to email me and ask me for it, I'll be happy to send you their 200-page report that deals with that issue. So um, it, so the, the phenomenon is happening. It's only the church that's pretty much asleep to it. And the, of course, the you know the mainstream press, which is pretty much asleep to anything that is important. But I tell you what I'm going to do. This is going to be a brand new Flash Hagman and Hagman exclusive. Um, we just released a new book this week titled Cauldron: Supernatural Implications of the Current Middle East. It puts into perspective the push by even members of the Knesset, the Israeli government, to build the third temple, uh, the Temple of Antichrist, I believe, if that happens that way. It talks about Gog and Magog, Russia, China, Europe, all this stuff that's unfolding right now. If you're intending to buy that book, here's what I want you to do. If you go to, if you go to Survivor Mall to buy that book, you're already also going to get David Flynn's masterpiece, Temple at the Center of Time. You're also going to get that DVD that everybody's talking about right now, The Blood Moons Are Here, which I want to say something about in a moment, by uh, Mark Biltz. But don't pay 20 bucks for it. We'll give it to you for free. But i am tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you Exo Vaticana. I've never done this before. It's a 600-page, probably the, probably the best document ever produced by Defender Publishing on what's happening within the alien uh, agenda, what's happening in the Vatican right now, why the Pope is doing much of what he's doing, but it also goes into great detail. So here's what you can do. Um, if you buy Cauldron, just type into the comments box, I heard you on Hagman. And I'm going to tell Survivor Mall to give you the book Exo Vaticana. So I appreciate Doug telling you to go there and buy it. I don't want you to buy it. I want you to have it free because the information we're talking about is so important. And with the money you'll save, go over to stevequill.com and get his book. It's brand new. He can't afford to give it away. you got to get it. It's a xenogenesis. And so you have the, the, the instruments and the information in your hands. So uh, I hope hopefully that made sense. If you buy Cauldron, just type in the comments box. I heard you on Hagman. I'm going to tell them to give you David Flynn's book, give you the Blood Moons Are Here, uh, and give you uh, Exo Vaticana. It's like 60 or $70 worth of stuff. You can have it because I want you to have it. Now listen, um, on the Blood Moons Are Here, this is not what we're talking about tonight, and I'm not going to get into the to the question of it. But I, Steve Quell and I have a mutual friend by the name of Chris White. He produced a video that people can watch for free on YouTube called The Blood Moons Debunked. And I think it's important that you go and watch his video. So watch it. We'll give you the Mark Biltz movie for free. Watch the two of them side by side and make up your own minds because – uh, I think there may or may not be something to the whole blood moons phenomenon. I don't know. I know Chris makes some very powerful points. Uh, Mark Biltz, many people believe, makes some very powerful points. But we'll just give it to you, and then you can make up your own mind. All right, Steve, um, back to this whole question of the Raphaim and these skulls and how all this activity is happening over there. And I don't think the media is just missing it. I Frankly, I think they're covering it up. I think something's going on that we can't yet quite wrap our minds around. But but I want to point out to people how that this was this was prof, the most ancient texts around the world. All of them, all of them predicted that at the end, including the Bible, that at the end of time there would come an awakening. These giants are going to rise. The Raphaim, the Nephilim, Nephilim. Now the Raphaim are say uh, it is said about them that they cannot rise but i think that has to do with eternal salvation they cannot take part in the secondary uh, in the in the resurrection that we will take part in um agreed because agreed. there's other places in scripture that do talk about them uh being animated and isaiah even seems to pray that god will keep that uh from happening so it's that would indicate that it's possible. But they were, dis even in the Rosh Shamra text, these are some of the most ancient writings the, the, that were found in the Ugarit in northern Syria. And some of, the, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they just found six more scrolls. They talk about these Raphaim as these demigods that were worshipped by the Amorite god Baal, the ruler of the underworld. But the prophet Isaiah describes them as shades, now listen, because this is important. This really ties into everything that's going on around the world right now. What does he say? He says that they greet the defeated 
uh, Babylonian leader within the infernal region. Here, here's what it says, Isaiah 14, 9, 10. Hell, that is Sheol, from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead. That uh, Hebrew word there, dead, is Raphaim. It stirreth up the Raphaim for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, and they shall speak unto thee. Uh, and art thou become weak as we art thou become like unto us? Now, in quote, the ancient Hebrews that translated the Septuagint into Greek understood that the prophet Isaiah in chapters 13 and 14 as using Raphaim, that he was using this to predict a second sense. Chris Putnam also agrees with this, by the way, to predict a return of these giants with monsters at the advent of the destruction of Babylon in the final age. Why do they believe that? Well, here's what here's how the Septuagint reads. Uh, the vision, this is from uh, Isaiah 13, 1 through uh, 3, and then 9, The vision which Isaiah, son of Amos, saw against Babylon, lift up a standard on the mountain of the plain, exalt the voice with him, beckon with the hand, open the gates. Steve and I did a whole show on that. The gates, ye ruler, I give command and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. For behold, the day of the Lord is coming which cannot be escaped, a day of wrath and anger to make the world desolate. And Babylon shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, and monsters shall rest there, and devils shall dance there. And satires, satires are transgenics. They're half human, half animals. Satires shall dance there. So this is what Isaiah saw at the end of time. Now, the 16th chapter of the book of Enoch also writes, of these deceased offspring of the watchers, the spirit of the giants or the Nephilim, being released at the end of time to bring slaughter and destruction upon man. Here's what 1 Enoch 16, 1 says, For the days of the slaughter and destruction of death of the giants, from the souls of whose flesh the spirits have gone forth, shall destroy without incurring judgment. Thus shall they destroy until the day of the consummation, the great judgment of which the age shall be consummated, over the watchers and the godless, yea, shall be wholly consummated. Then you have the book of Jubilees. Now, this is an ancient Jewish religious work, but it's considered inspired scripture by some of the Orthodox ch- uh, churches as well as the Jews in uh, uh, Ethiopia. And it parallels kind of the same frightening scenario, prophesying that the spirits of the Nephilim on earth in the last days is going to happen. Um, but in this passage... Now, God is ready to destroy all these demons after the flood, and Noah prays that his descendants be released from their attacks. There's Mastema, which is an alternate name for Satan. He intervenes, and he implores God to allow him to retain and control one-tenth of these demons in order to exercise his authority because they're needed, Here, well, here's what it says, to corrupt and lead astray before my judgment. In other words, this corruption will peak just before Satan's judged in Revelation 20. And here's what it says, Jubilees 10, 7 through 9. And the Lord our God spoke to us so that we might bind all of them, that is the Nephilim spirits. And the chief of the spirits, Mastema, came and he said, O Lord, creator, leave some of them before me and let them obey my voice and let them do everything which I tell them, because if some of them are not left to me, I will not be able to exercise the authority of my will among the children of men because they are intended to corrupt and lead astray before my judgment because the evil of the sons of men is great. And the Lord said, Let a tenth of them remain before him, but let nine parts go down into the place of judgment." So uh, I don't want to get bogged down in all that, but the bottom line is, according to these texts, God has allowed Satan power to exercise dominion over the earth with an army of demons, including the spirits of the Nephilim, spawned in the ancient world as part of what's going to play out during the end times in the Great Tribulation period. And their job description is the corruption of humanity. Um, So, man, I've got all these text in front of me. I probably better not do it. It's going to dominate the show. The bottom line is, there is there are numerous texts. So whether we're talking about the book of Joel, 
uh, whether we're talking about what happens when the fifth judgment trumpet sounds and the freak show locust hordes come up out of the uh, up out of the earth, um, when all of these texts are added up, there's persuasive evidence that even Joel's army is going to be something more than simple grasshoppers. You agree, Steve? Absolutely. It's totally, totally, totally a supernatural army. And that's, and again, I quoted that earlier, but you quoted the whole scripture that hell beneath is moved at thy coming. I think what people have to understand right now, Tom, is every barrier that was put in place for our benefit. And by the way, you quoted the scripture about the satires. The Russians just basically broke the story that they found a satire skeleton. And though there's a blockage of the image, there's also a huge, real giant skeleton, not one of the dumb ones that's photoshopped on the Internet. They have the skeleton of the satyr. Did you see that? I did not. Well, so look at look at how, and I want to share something very cool. That happened two days ago, and it was the Russians that broke the story. If I were personally going to give any advice, and not that they need it, but all that the Russians have to do is basically tell the truth about UFOs and tell the truth, because Dr. Ernest Moldeshev, a Russian optical surgeon, is one of the foremost experts in the world on giants. If they were to do that, that would show the American people that not only are they being lied to about health care, but about the core realities. And it's my opinion, I can't say anything, it's just my opinion, that that's going to take place. Because if people don't understand all the money paid to Egypt for their military. You know what that bought all these years? Their silence and their covering up. One of the biggest questions I get, where are the skeletons of the giants? Do you really believe the Smithsonian covers it up? I've dealt with, in, in my book, True Legends of History of the Smithsonian, I've dealt with the history of Powell. I've dealt with all that stuff. But what I'm saying now, bringing us right up to context, Tom, this just blew my mind as you were quoting that scripture, to show you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a secondary witness, even in this radio show, and Tom and I did not talk. We only spoke by emails and probably three-sentence emails, that this satyr, I believe this, Tom, I believe God in his amazing grace had that revelation to be given within the last two days, maybe three days, of the satyr found. And obviously the archaeologists won't say, and they're, they're dismissing, quote, all of those speculations, but they won't say what it is. You follow me? Well, They'll sure. say those are all mindless speculations, but they won't say what it is. And there's a two-second segment, two seconds. You have to stop the thing, and you're going to see a giant skeleton and Russians in real time, and they're lifting it out in some kind of a plaster cast like they typically do. And, Tom, I believe again tonight... I believe this with all my heart, and it's not because I believe it, it's true. It's because God's word has declared it to be true. You're giving the historic context of the truth. I believe the satyrs are already there, and I want to share something to attenuate what Tom said. I've told the story on talk radio for over a decade, but I knew one of the most active, wicked, hateful men in the Central Intelligence Agency who was a hitter. That means he was an assassin. The bottom line is, when I saw that man weep, he was as cold-blooded as, I promise you, if you walked into a haunted house, he was that cold. Yet I watched him weep and sob when he had a meltdown describing those very things, Tom, the underground labs. And that was almost 13 years ago. By the way, I just had uh, Robert J. I won't give his last name, but I want to thank him. Guess what? The, the I took the 12 tallest buildings. I didn't, but he did. And this was impressed upon me. I never thought of this in my life. It's amazing. Robert just did it, and it comes out to be 144,486029089. And if you take if then now this is interesting. That's the square root, okay? If you take the cube root, it's three by three by three, twenty-seven. So you see what I'm saying right there. The point being is every height of all of these inter, I would say, dimensional transmitters coupled, and I want to make this clear, I've never said this before, and Robert, thank you so much, and also those of you who did it too, but Robert was the first one, Kate, others, thank you for sending it to me. But the point is, there is a, a supernatural basis for determining the height of the world's tallest buildings. 
and the dozen was critical. 144,000, you don't think that's biblical? Three <laughs> times, three times, three? You know? So that's fascinating, Tom. Tonight, in my, uh, uh, I would say this, being blown away mode, and when I listen to you, by the way, don't worry about dominating. I love to sit back and listen to you, and I want to say this, ladies and gentlemen, my favorite website, I don't say this to, to flatter Tom, but my favorite website, obviously, it's because it deals with the stuff I like, is Raiders News Update. I love the site. And, Tom, you remember when we talked about bringing Pember's book out, Earth's Earliest Ages? I think you right. asked me, Steve, what's the most important book if I wanted to go bring out an older library of the great, great uh, treasures of history? It was Earth's Earliest Ages that I said, well, you need to do that, and you did it. Thank you. Thank you, right. thank you, thank you. Everybody that reads that is blessed by it. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, and then the last time we were on Hagman, that was our flash giveaway, and i got to tell you, lots of people wanted that book, and we're, we were glad to give it to them, because, uh, but you were the one that led me to put that book back into print. It was a hundred and some years out of print. Uh, there were some, well, you, what, I think you paid quite a bit of money for a used version, didn't you? Uh, oh, I, of, I paid uh, big dollars. I mean, really big dollars. Yeah, and, I mean, and because it was that critical. So, so what I'm saying is, God's given you and I. You know what we do? We have a ministry of shoehorns. Okay, <laughs> we are the shoehorns to put people's feet in the preparation of the gospel in order that they may walk out their callings and have an answer to give to every man. Because, Tom, my number one concern is the church is uh, some of the biggest names in Christianity, Rick Warren and the Hillsong guy, I forget his name, they're all embracing Chrislam. Meanwhile, Chrislam, or Islam is slaughtering, they're butchering. I want to share this and turn it right back over to you. Cannibalism, beheading, mutilation are all the signatures of the fallen ones it's the signature of the fallen one i asked jesus a long time ago i said lord what's your def what's a good definition of lust being pr- delivered from the, the world and the lust it's the appetite of demons disembodied spirits expressed through humans and see, this is what's interesting to me, Tom, because when you're bringing up, and, and I'm sorry if I sound excited, I, would, I love to listen to you. That's not flattery, because I love to see, just like tonight, the keys. It's kind of like, do you, do you understand what I'm trying to get across? Am I communicating that, that when we get together, it's a time lock, and then it seems like a whole bunch of stuff opens up immediately or right at the time? I'm just saying that it's amazing. It's like God has a time lock on this information based on the, the – he gave it to Daniel, seal it up, Daniel, for, for the right. point of time. So I'm just thrilled. So take all the time well, you well, need. Well, well um, as an example, let me ask you a question because I'll, I will bet money that you have not read the book we just published called Cauldron. Have you read it? No, I have not. You have not. You you may not. But the but the thing is what you, what you wouldn't know is some of – you were almost quoting aspects of it when you were talking about uh, Gog and Magog in Russia and the finding of this uh, creature, because it goes into how Ezekiel was a Levite during the Babylonian activity. He's one of the most important Old Testament prophets, but he's the one that gave us the view of the world's final battle. He called it the Battle of Gog and Magog. Revelation calls it the Battle of Armageddon. But he foresaw the battle of Gog and Magog that leads to this final confrontation. Uh, I will bring thee forth and all thy army. Now, what are we seeing happening right now? Russia all of a sudden has a new appetite, doesn't it, for going after uh, things that it wants. I'm going to put a hook in your jaw. I'm going to bring you down. You're going to come down clothed with armor and a great army and bucklers and shields and blah, blah, blah. But it mentions... Persia, Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, they're going to come with you after this thing that you've decided to come and take away uh, from uh, Israel. Notice today's headlines that Obama is pushing uh, Russia into reconsidering its relationship with Iran. Is all this stuff just a coincidence? I don't think so. But what Steve mentioned was the discovery of giants and the discovery of these characters. What a lot of people don't know is how Gog and Magog are connected by Ezekiel to giants in the underworld, and that they are down there now clasping their weapons, waiting for the moment when they can be released for war. Read Ezekiel 32. Read verses 26 through 27 or uh, 28, whatever it is specifically, but Ezekiel 32. And read it in the Septuagint version. 
where he says there are there laid Meshach and Tubal or 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 Gog and Magog who caused their fear in the land of the living and they are laid. What does it say? Read it. Go and read it. They are laid with the giants that fell of old who went down into Hades with their weapons of war and they laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities are upon their bones because they terrified men during their life. And so uh, Ezekiel, this most important prophet, connects this whole invasion of Gog and Magog once again with these giants who went into hell with their battle armaments, Steve, who are ready to rise in war. Uh, Chapter 39, Ezekiel, he says, Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and Magog. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots. But what does it say? And also with mighty men. And this is the Hebrew, Giborim. And with all men of war, saith the Lord. So you have this Old Testament word that, as you know, is often used for the giants and the offspring of the watchers and Nephilim. Sometimes it might refer to men as mighty warriors, but in several places in Ezekiel, the reference is to giants as mighty warriors. Most theologians would say that. Of course, there's also the old English legends. And I think, I don't know if it was your book on giants or if it was, um, maybe it was your last one uh, that I read, but you go into Gog and Magog, uh, and how that there was these English legends of these giants, and therefore some believe that Ezekiel is actually depicting Gog as a literal giant of old who's going to return with men and giants to lead this attack of Israel and also against the church with the aid of these other human nations in the end times. Also consider the book of Revelation 20, uh, 7 through 8, which says that after the thousand-year millennial reign is expired, what happens? A gate is opened again, and Satan is loosed out of his prison. And what does he do? He goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, and lo and behold, here again is Gog and Magog gathered together to battle, the number of whom it says is as the sand of the sea. So you have Bible references. You have uh, the books of Enoch. You have the books of Jubilees, both of which were read by the followers of Jesus. You have the prophet, the prophecy uh, in the book of um, Enoch that, let's see, how does it go? Um, well, anyway, talks about how that uh, Enoch is told that Persia, Iran, is going to lead the world in its final, att- a final attempt to destroy the Jews. And if you go and you read his excerpt, somebody wants to email me. I apologize for being inarticulate right now because my mind can't quite remember the text, but I'd be happy to send it to you. But he talks about how in those days the angels are going to assemble, and they're going to turn their heads towards the east and towards the people of Persia, uh, Iran, Uh, And he's going to excite their king. And then a spirit of disturbance is going to come upon them. Uh, And they're going to ascend and step upon the land of the chosen. And so Iran, Gog and Magog, the giants, they're going to come. Uh, But here's the important part that Enoch says. And I think this is in chapter 56. It's a very important text that he adds to this. When he's talking about Persia and all these armies that are going to gather against Israel, read Enoch chapter 56, I believe, somewhere around verses 5 or 7 or 8. And he says, And in those days the mouth of Sheol will be opened, the mouth of hell, and they will sink into it, and their destruction shall shall devour the sinners from the presence of the chosen. So gates opening, Sheol opening, giants arising. But at the same time, it says, when all of a sudden Gog and Magog, Russia and Iran, are all excited about coming down into Israel to take some great spoil. Now, knowing that those were prophesied, look at the world today. And what are you hearing? What did Steve just tell you? They've discovered these. What's happening over there? What, what's happening? They've discovered some kind of, what was it, a satire? They've discovered some transgender. Yeah, they, a, a, a giant, a, a, the skeleton of a satire. And a, and a huge, huge uh, giant, too, okay? It shows it in the video. And, Tom, I want to share this. Just let me interrupt this one point. Because, again, this is critical that people understand. This is where classic dispensationalism fails 
so tragically because you made the statement that the people of God are totally un prepared for this. There is no fear in love God. I mean, the love of God will protect his people. So when you read Psalm 91, you can apply it. Here's what I want to say. I'm going to turn it right back over to you. Gog and Magog are the patron giants of the city of London. And the city of London is not the uh, town of London. The city of London, as V has stated so many times, is the control mechanism for the money of the world. If people understand that the wisdom of the giants, you can use the word channeled, passed through, given unto, the point that I'm trying to make in this is that when Jesus said the love of money is the root of all evil, I've stated the control of money is the control of all evil, you cannot separate the giant. Go just Google, go do a search, anybody search, start page, whoever. It's probably start page because they don't keep track of your IP. Go to start page and Google uh, Gog and Magog, protectors of London. You cannot separate the British Isles and their history of giants. You cannot separate the uh, presence of giants in history, and you cannot separate the intelligence of the giants in controlling everything. Hawk sent me an email. I want to read this to everybody because this is really good and uh, uh, really, really makes sense, okay? Uh, the idea is that uh, Chile, here's what he said, Hawk said, they can be hitting Chile and Peru and also Syria to unlock via the quakes, the underground chambers of the giants. My view, Hawk speaking, I share his view, is that the fallen angels are directing this Luciferian team in its attacks. Specifically, those good people in the intel world are describing this effort by Obama and Spetsnaz, the universities, research institutes, etc., are setting up the end-time signs and wonders of Lucifer using these harp-like devices, scalar weapons, ionosphere heaters, ELF antennas, arrays, etc. And he just goes on to say, it, he's making my case already, but he's just attenuating it, saying point blank, there are totally, totally, totally every indication, there, I guess I should say it this way, there is total indication that everything that we see playing out is being orchestrated by the intelligence of fallen angels, by demons, the disembodied spirits of the giants, and those who have yielded through the dark arts and the dark magic arts, magical arts, and all of the secret societies, they are all in unison and all in, I almost say, lockstep singleness of purpose, bringing about what you just spoke about through the scriptures. Go ahead. Well, I tell you, there are so many things uh, this first two hours. I mean, can you believe that we're almost at two hours already? Uh, it light up, It lights up my thinking cap. And as always with Tom Horn, I'm you know I'm this old preacher, so I get on a pig trail and I can get off track, and I don't stay on track very well. I do that when I speak at these conferences and stuff too. And <laughs> sometimes I have to just throw up my hands and ask the people to forgive me and start over again. But um, but that also always happens, Steve, when you and I get together. But one thing um, that I would like to point out. Um, to people, and that Doug had said in the first hour that he wanted us to address in this hour, and that has to do with the Stanford Prison Experiments and the Milgram Experiments, because of what those studies illustrated um, about the silent but inescapable dark side. Now, does this have something to do with something Steve Quayle mentioned in the first hour, that there could be something that's – it lies dormant in the genetic makeup of fallen men, but it must be crucified in the born again. And if it's not crucified in the born again, it lays there dormant, ready for activation in those that are not born again. Um, and it simply has to do with the dark side of human nature – that can be, and that has been in the past, by the way, evoked among humans, and that I think is going to play a role in this coming war between Christian versus Christians that we started out the program talking about. Um, and Steve and Doug and Joe, I really think that this is probably one of the most forgotten aspects 
of Bible prophecy. People think about Bible prophecy. They talk about, you know, the the, the what? They talk about technological signs. They talk about famine and earthquakes and plagues. They talk about lawlessness. Uh, all those things that are in Matthew 24 and that are real and that are important. But the one thing that most Christians seem to miss altogether is that there is a war that is coming between Christians, the religious followers of the Antichrist, Christians of the Antichrist, um, or what we simply might call Christian versus Christian. Now, we've always thought that for true believers, how would I connect this to the, the Stanford experiment and the Milgram experiment? We've always thought that for true believers to be persecuted to the point of death here in the United States. Well, obviously, it was going to take a dramatic sea change in public opinion from our grandparents, America, right? But that's exactly what's been happening. Slowly at first, rapidly over the last five, six years, um, you can go and Google um, the January 2014, so we're talking three months ago or something, the Pew Research Center, this is a prestigious think tank. It's based in Washington, D.C. It's secular. But it provides information on social issues, demographic trends that shape the world. But they published uh, an article, a document actually, called Religious Hostilities Reach Six-Year High. This is a really important report from these worldwide public opinion surveyors because what they've done is they've chronicled the steady, documentable growth of religious persecution around the world, and what they found was that social hostilities involving religion are currently most directed against people of the Christian faith. Now, right on the heels of that, there was another report from the non-denominational group called Open Doors that you can also Google that says that the number of Christians martyred around the world for their faith nearly doubled in 2013. So their findings separately confirmed the discoveries of the um, Pew Research Center. But what's interesting, Steve, uh, Doug, and Joe, is how the Pew findings specifically detail an escalation in the United States from the lowest category of government restrictions on Christian expressions, and this only as of mid-2009, so we're not talking about a long time ago, from 2009 to 2014, we went from the lowest now to an advanced category in only three years, and right now we're continuing upward uh, at the time of this conversation. And if recent activity and if these if these statistics continue to, to simply follow their current trajectory, it's not going to be long before one nation under God joins those red-listed countries around the world where Bible-based believers are finding themselves being murdered for their faith, being killed for their faith, finding the most severe discrimination. These are facts. This is not Tom Horn pontificating out here. In fact, the National Review Online, uh, uh, another article people ought to go and get, they recently posted a critical review by a guy by the name of Raymond Ibrahim. He's a showman fellow at the David Horowitz uh, Freedom Center, but he cites... The 2014, so very current, watch list report. Now, watch list I've followed over the years. This is a list that ranks the 50 nations where Christians are most persecuted. And he cites their findings to determine that, here's a quote, the United States is now the chief facilitator of the persecution of Christians around the world today, end quote. Now, Abraham's assertions, what he's mostly doing is he's reflecting America's involvement in foreign conflicts that are leading to uh, repression of expressions of the Christian uh, faith. But set that aside for a moment and ask yourself, okay, so the United States is involving itself in wars of option that's leading to the killing, the beheading, the burning, the destroying of Christians around the world. But what about here in the United States? So maybe that's all just a big mistake over there, right? Something that we shouldn't have done, but surely here in the United States we don't see the same trend. Not true. The Pew Research uh, information and the Open Doors information uh, validated what I did just before I went on the show tonight. I did a really simple, quick web search. Anybody could do this. And I found so many headlines 
statistics showing how Christianity is being repressed here in the United States. Here's just a few if you want to find them for yourself. A January 25, 2014 news story at CNN titled, Legal Group Reports Dramatic Increase in Hostility Toward Christian Students in Public Schools, end quote. And the article's important because it makes a distinction that the upswing in the incident reports of the persecution of Christians in schools is not bullying from other students, but rather it's mistreatment by school officials themselves who are getting marching orders from the federal government. And the report uh, shows that the hostility from these teachers and school administrators are curtailing not just anybody's religious faith, specifically the free speech rights of Christians simply because they are Christian and they hold a Christian worldview. Another article I found, by the way, I found 30-some articles, so I'm not going to go through all these. I'll just give you a couple of them. A second article I found, February 2, 2014, CBS Story Online, uh, outlines how an in, uh, an, a North Carolina high school football coach was ordered to cease baptisms and leading prayers for students. Now, here's why this is important. Even when he's not on school grounds. Now, let that sink in for a moment. The, the baptism that this coach performed was simply because he was attending his own church in the town where he lives, the Charles Mack Citizen Center, and some of the kids from the school also attend that church. And he was invited at church, not at school. He wasn't out on school campus trying to proselyte kids or anything else. He's at his church. Some of the kids attend there that are also kids that he coaches. He was asked by the pastor to participate in baptizing these kids because he's their coach. So he did. It immediately led to the Freedom From Religion Foundation attorneys filing a federal lawsuit against the school. And here's a quote from their uh, legalese. It says, it is a violation of the Constitution for the Mooresville High School football coach to organize, lead, or participate in prayers or other religious proselytizing before, during, or after games and practices. It is a well-settled public schools, listen to this, public schools, and by extension, public school officials may not advance or promote religion, end quote. Think about the incredible legal assertion that they're making here. They're saying that if you are a Christian and you're part of a public school, you're a teacher or whatever, you cannot in your public life participate in advancing the gospel in any way because you are owned by the federal government as a teacher and therefore you have no rights whatsoever in any circumstances to share your, your public faith. I mean, that's just incredible. Okay, I don't got time to do all these. A December 9, 2013 news report by Matt Barber. The title of his article, Blogging Gays Urge Murder Castration of Christians. A World Net Daily February article of this. These are all, by the way, this year, the last 90 days, with uh, U L U.S. Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, the stinging headline, General Says U.S. Christians Targeted for Murder. So, here in the blessed one nation under God is already unfolding a mindset. And uh, so, in the beginning of this show tonight, we were talking about the, the coming division, the social division that is going to uh, develop as a result of those who say we are Christian, conservative Christians, those who might oppose the wholesale genetic alteration of humans. Again, I got right in front of me Steve Quell's new book, Xenogenesis, Changing Men into Monsters. Those who would oppose walking over, assaulting God's creative genius, that we, we say, wait a minute, there might be something wrong with this. Genetically modified foods might lead to... Uh, diseases, genetically modified animals, genetically modified humans, even our own military is being advised that this could lead to unprecedented changes in phenotypic character. But if we stand opposed to genetic modification, like the one news article I quoted uh, on GMO Foods at the start of this broadcast, now we're being defined as not just repressive, not just old-fashioned, not just dingbats out here, the Bible thumpers or whatever. We're murderers. We're murderers because we are standing in the way of a of a wonderful new utopian 
eternal life that could be genetically engineered, and those who oppose it need to be dealt with, and they need to be dealt with severely. And among those who oppose it are the conservative Christians, and therefore there is, something's developing now to stereotype, to set aside conservative Christian voices. How many more years, maybe not even years, how many more months will Joe and Doug Hagman be able to go online and broadcast the truth? The Internet's being turned over to uh, Marxists as we speak. The U.S. is giving up control of the Internet. How long will we, will we be able to share this truth with you? How long will Steve Quill and Tom Horn be, have the freedom to be able to do what we want? People in Oregon right now are being sued that own uh, 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 a cake company where they make wedding state of Oregon has filed has joined a lawsuit against them saying that they cannot uh, 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 decline making wedding cakes for gay couples well how long then will it be before the churches are told you have to be able to perform gay weddings and if you won't perform a gay wedding you're shut down you're not going to be recognized as a nonprofit organization I'm telling you folks this is coming. But what those examples fail to mention is something that is really important that the listeners need to hear. And that is the developing emergence on the world scene of what's going to become one of the greatest threats ever raised against the authentic body of Christ is going to be Christians themselves. Religious Christians are going to form perhaps the most egregious body of individuals that are going to give license to the destruction of the truly born again. And people that are listening to this, true students of prophecy, already know that. They know it's not only predictable, it was a prophesied prelude to a period in history wherein true believers, well, what does it say in Revelation 20? They're going to be beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and for not worshiping the beast, neither his image, neither his mark upon their foreheads. But whenever we discuss that end-time scenario, and in particular, the subject of rigorous persecution, the one thing that, for whatever reason, people in the church don't ever seem to connect, is that religious Christians are being shaped today to play against the true body of Christ, um, a, a role, well, frankly, uh, Steve, it's almost beyond credulity. I mean, if it was not for what the the Bible itself tells us it would be unbelievable. It would be unbelievable to me. And yet I know that it's coming. I can see it happening right now. And Jesus said, you sent me the text a couple of days ago for a contribution you made to a book that we're publishing. You pointed out how Jesus said that the time's coming when whoever kills you is going to think that they're doing God a service. They're going to think that they're in the ministry. Um. And then in Matthew 24, uh, 9, and 12, 9 through 12, Jesus tells his disciples, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And they're gonna, you're going to be hated for all, of all groups of people, for my all ethnos, for my name's sake. And then many are going to be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, so these are religious figures, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So this is prophesied in the Scripture. Elsewhere in the Scripture, it tells us during the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist is going to be given power to what? To make war with the saints, and to overcome them. Revelation 13, Daniel 7. Then immediately following those verses, it starts describing how this is going to happen. He says, a second beast with two horns like a lamb is going to rise, and he's going to speak as a dragon. And most evangelical scholars identify that second beast as the leader of this end times religious institution who's going to be under Satan's control, this phrase, like a lamb indicates he's going to pretend to represent the Lamb of God in the Christian church, but the expression speaks as a dragon, identifies that devilish source of his authority and power. So he's a final global super church leader, and he is going to be a murderer, not unlike the Antichrist. He's going to give voice to it that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So I, I know I'm going on and on here, but the bottom line is the book of Revelation outlines 
how this political figure of the Antichrist is going to derive ultra-national dominance from the world's religious faithful through the influence of an ecclesiastical leader who is not going to hesitate to swim in the blood of the genuine saints of God. That's prophecy. It's predicted to come. And it's wrapped around that are the things we've been talking about tonight. It's going to come when? When Gog and Magog and Persia are aligning themselves against Israel and the powers that be in the world are putting pressure on Israel to give up Jerusalem. Then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and, and, and then add to that the most exotic discovery that giants and and all of a sudden we're finding these skulls and and legitimate DNA is being done that says they're not in any way related to humans uh, in a sense that we can determine, but that in those same areas, manifestation, supernatural phenomena is unfolding that seems to echo the prophecies of the ancients who said that at this very time things are going to begin happening. The ancients are going to awaken um, Tom Horn's not trying to hype you. I'm trying to tell you that this is prophesied uh, to come. Now, I said I wanted to say something about the Stanford uh, experiment and the Milford, uh, Milgram experiment, but I may have gone on so long I need to let somebody else talk. Uh, so, we Tom. are up, up against the half of the hour break, and we will take that now. But you, you guys are so right on the money. I mean, um, I don't know how many are familiar with the 21st century digital government strategy uh, issued by Barack Obama or the National Strategy for Biosurveillance. Both uh, talk about the merging of computers with humans uh, under the healthcare law and for purposes of consolidation of information, both economical and uh, health reasons. But it's uh, startling. You know, every other week there's an article that we see Google. Mapping your brain. Google will connect, be able to connect with your brain in 2020. The cutting edge radio, in my view. I'm Doug Hagman. In studio with me is Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report for the together for the final hour with a very special guest, Mr. Steve Quayle. SteveQuayle.com. Genesis Six Giants as well website there and his new book Xenogenesis. Folks, you've got to get this book. I'm telling you right now, it's in my view, uh, it completes, it, it bookends uh, really uh, uh, Genesis Six Giants, uh, Angel Wars, True Legends, Weather Wars, and now Xenogenesis. So I got to tell you, it's a fantastic uh, work. And uh, one thing that caught my attention in this is the tattooing part uh, of, of the book. Of all things, uh, it's something that I think you folks you really need to really focus on. And of course. Our other very special guest, Mr. Tom Horn. Uh, Tom Horn, of course, a speaker, prolific author. You can find him at RaidersNewsUpdate.com. That's RaidersNewsUpdate.com. And I want to thank him for offering uh, that package for the listeners of the Hagman and Hagman Report. What a terrific package. I'm going to certainly take uh, advantage of that after the show. With that, I want to welcome you both. Oh, one more thing, folks. Tuesday, uh, uh, Tuesday, Steve Quayle and V, the Girl Economist, I've gotten a lot of emails asking, based on Russia, Ukraine, Crimea, uh, China even, uh, to have them back. Of course, they've agreed to come back on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to be live from sunny Florida. And tomorrow night, Augusto Perez and Brother Marcus. But with that, Steve, I'm going to turn it back to you, sir. Well, thank you. I want to go back to the days of Noah because I think that's one of the most skirted, misunderstood, but I really believe that is as uh, wrong biblically as the movie Noah is. The fact that it's being brought out at this time, I think, is just one of those absolute, if you will, neon signposts. Can God use the things that aren't even biblically correct? Sure, he doesn't endorse it. But if you notice the, the subject matter of it, it's very timely. What was the sign, Doug, that God would not destroy the earth by a flood again? What was it? Real Rainbow. simple. Rainbow. No. Rainbow. Rainbow, okay. One of the most important s subject matters in my book, Xenogenesis. Ladies and gentlemen, 
this is the end for me. When I say that, I don't, I'm not being taken. I wish I was going in a chariot tonight, but I don't think that's the case. And I'm not comparing myself to Elijah. I'm just saying that would be nice, wouldn't it? The point is, is that we're in a time period unlike any other. But one of the most important chapters in my book is chapter 13. You know what I just figured out? Chapter 13 is the one that it, it ended up being under the rainbow. And this is by the CIA guy, Mr. Langley, given to my friend Will. And I want to share something with people because you've got to understand that that the rainbow is everything. And those of you who send me and you've seen them on air crap, by the way, one of the best websites out there, and this is the name of it, so you know, if you're offended by the word crap, uh, you know, get over it. It's air crap, A I R C R A P dot org. Aircrap dot org, okay? But one of the things that people send me, Doug, every day, and Tom, they send, I'm sure you get them too, but all the chemtrails and, and the sun ghosts and, and the strange colors in the atmosphere. Remember this, color is nothing more than specific frequencies or vibrations of light. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth. And what did God say? Let there be light, okay? So this is critical. The rainbow is more, and this is out of chapter 13 of my book, Xenogenesis is only available from me, ladies and gentlemen. It, I do that on purpose. I want you to be able to get this. It's the singular most important thing. You heard Doug say that, and Doug sent me an email after reading it, and Sheila did too, just saying, wow. This, I think it was uh, one guy sent me an email saying, I can't even go beyond two pages without going, wow, God, the ramifications are overwhelming. But now I'm going to quote from Mr. Langley, given to my friend Will. Will, if you're listening to this or do listen, God bless you, my brother. You probably have no idea how God has used you, but I bless you for it. Here's what, here's what he said, Mr. Langley, to my friend Will. Remember that the rainbow is more than just a pretty promise that God put in the sky. It is a visual representation of the atmosphere. The different colors represent frequencies of light. Those frequency layers were put there by God as a barrier to block certain dark frequencies from being able to be as active on the earth. He went on to make the following points. He said, Project Blue Beam is more than just a code name. The blue, violet, and purple colors, or the frequencies that represent our God frequencies, the alpha and omega frequencies. Remember, alpha and omega. Who said he was alpha and omega? I am the alpha and the omega, Jesus. He said this, the current scientific work being done by the powers that be are to lessen or eliminate those three colors or barriers so that there will be an increase in the dark frequencies or the shades or the shadows. The more readily visible frequencies, colors represent the more worldly and dark forces, which do not seem natural to us, as yellows and oranges would seem to us to be happy colors. The more visible to us in the state of existence, the further these frequencies are from God, more worldly. Removing the blue, violet, purple through harp and other means results in a concentration of negative power. Now remember, this isn't a new age term. They're talking literally about principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, and heavenly places. That's the word he's using. By eliminating or lessening the blue range of light, they are removing Removing the barriers that keep the dark frequencies in check, allowing them to concentrate, allowing dark forces to come together and increase in strength. God's rainbow is a visible reminder that he has all of the forces of nature and spirit in check. Some men understand this and are working to eliminate those checks and balances for their own and dark forces agenda. The rainbow represents the atmospheric covering that God placed over around the earth at the flood so that, here's the key everyone, so that the demonic forces would not have the ability to directly interact with man like they did in the days of Noah. Of course, the Bible says at the end of the time, it will be as in the days of Noah. So you can see how important to the powers that be to put things back like they were before the flood. I had a special operations general who's still active duty tell me in no uncertain terms. He said, Steve, all of the chemtrails and all the electromagnetic attenuation of the Earth's atmosphere is to bring us back to the atmosphere present at the time. And these were his words. If you get angry at pre-Adamic stuff, as it was right before the flood. After the flood, God put a new balance in the atmosphere. And he said, when you see every single chemtrail pilot spraying, know that some of them know, some don't know, but they are directly making war on God. He said this to me. He said, the outer bands of the rainbow, if you will, are like riverbanks. Within the riverbanks flow 
the power of God, the purpose of God, and the protection of God. These guys are trying to break down everything and anything. Now, let me make this clear. In no way will they succeed. Greater is he who is in us, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he who is in the world. Jesus said, Behold, I give you power to tread on the serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And remember this. Serpents and scorpions, I mean, those aren't like heavenly creatures, okay? And we never encourage, uh, we never relate those in anything but to poison, being stung, and death. And he, he goes on, and this is so important. Ladies and gentlemen, please Please, I'm pleading with you for this reason. After 23 years of writing stuff, 10 books, and look, every one of my critics out there, ask them what they've done. And, you know, Tom, I'm just getting it again. But anybody who will turn their tongue on you, let me tell you this. This is something the Lord put in my spirit today, and I'm going to read something that Romy uh, wrote to me, uh, that the Spirit of God came upon her, Doug, before uh, we went on the radio. I just called her when we were on the break and asked if I had her permission to read it. But every one of you that will turn your tongue in attacking Tom Horn, Steve Quayle, Doug Hagman, you guys know who you are, you are coming into a crisis point in your life where the Lord will either give you time to repent or you'll have an Ananias and Sapphira moment. The purpose of redemption is so great in God's uh, plan of redemption that those who will, here's the bottom line, and I've never said this before in my life, and I believe this, if you will assassinate me with your tongue, there will be nothing to stop you from pulling the trigger when you have license to justify your phony self-righteousness. It's not just me. It's not just Tom Horn. It's not all the other guys. I'm not saying woe is us, it's Tom and I. No, all of us who are trying in these last breaths of freedom. It doesn't matter if it's Hawk. It doesn't matter if it's Greg Evenson. It doesn't matter if it's Russ Dizdar, uh, John Kyle, uh, Pastor David Langford, the people that are coming to the Whitestone Conference. The thing is, is that they want justification for their religion. They have no relationship. Now, I'm going to, I want to say this. I could go on and on on Chapter 13 of Xenogenesis. It's only available, please, ladies and gentlemen. I promise you it's the most important thing I've ever written, and it's also the probably, I think after, Tom, you read it, you'll be blown away with the fact that this is God's pleadings with rebellious mankind to basically see what's coming at them. Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. I'm not a prophet. Tom Horn doesn't claim to be a prophet. But we do have the testimony of Jesus. We do have a calling to warn. And when you've done the research that Tom has done, or I've done, then stand in line to gripe, complain, and use the B word. But until then, silence your tongues. Silence your tongues and get on your faces before the living God. I want to share this, and then I'm going to turn it right over to Tom. Tom, this is about another two minutes. Steve, this brother's word is correct. It is simple, but it's right. She's referring to, on my dreams and vision, a brother sent a word he got from the Lord yesterday. He said, as God was giving it to him his car, he didn't post this, military vehicles pulled up beside him. I think that was God's way of uh, sandwiching him between the truth. Here's what she says. God bless you, Romy. Thank you. I'm having a conniption fit of righteous, furious anger towards most of what calls itself the church today, and is not, Steve. Someone that I know and is busy trying to climb the social ladder in the church just sent me a so-called prophetic word asking me if I could verify that a certain elderly prophet, whom I love and uh, protect through my intercession, told another young ladder climber that he would be going home this year. I am enraged with this kind of behavior. Why would it matter to them if they are serving the living God and following after Jesus? They are concerned with catching mantles of powerful prophets and dividing up their cloaks before they even are taken by the Lord. In other words, these guys are fighting, or somebody's fighting over somebody who's going to be with the Lord, and he's already basically, uh, like the Roman soldiers around the cross, dividing up the cloak. The Lord never changes. Hallelujah. His anger and the cup of his wrath, beginning with his own household, will not be turned away again. When we should have been listening for his voice and repenting in sackcloth and ashes for our great sins, we have followed after the gods of this world and destroyed the reputation of his mighty warrior servants to gain place in the sight of others. Shame, shame, shame on the people who take the name of his son and prostitute it wherever they can for money, power, and place. 
Now, here's the prophecy. The Lord, the Lord, the sovereign Lord's cup of wrath is being poured out over his own household first, and he will no longer repent himself or show mercy because of the wickedness and hardness of their hearts. They have called out to strange gods and gathered together riches and unholy power. The living God and Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, will no longer be mocked. His judgment has arrived, and though he will spare a remnant for himself, the whole world will experience the convulsions of his mighty wrath. We have thought he did not see that he would turn away in mercy as he has throughout the ages yet no more all who have kept themselves holy and set apart will be set apart still and he will keep them through uh through though there be not many our mighty god's anger is kindled and those who have used his name in vain to gain from this world will die in their sin and great anguish and the whole world will see their shame while they cry out for mercy she's talking about a couple of the mega pastors she knows let the right or the, 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 i guess that's the lord let the right Righteous who belong to him in truth hide themselves away from the ungodliness of the world and rejoice because the redemption draws nigh. Jesus Christ will come at the appointed time and gather them, they who have remained holy. Remain holy still. Your reward awaits you. Those who are evil will not see his glory, but shall perish in their sins. Having mocked the Most High, your reward awaits you, and the whole world will see you for what you are, and you will reap your reward at their angry hands. You led many to destruction. They will destroy you, even as they will be destroyed. Woe unto the wicked who said they knew me and did not. You will find your place in hell in the eternal fire whose flame never ceases, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth throughout eternity. To my remnant, here's the end of it, to my remnant, come out from among these false brethren who have no part in me. I will keep you during the times that are coming upon the earth, and I will sustain you. Fear not for those who speak grandiose lies and are puffed up, who seem to be something and are full of evil plans to satisfy their evil deeds. Let the dead bury their dead, and do not turn back or mourn them. They are a stench in my nostrils, and you have no part in them. My church is not made with hands, as they would have you believe. They are not your Lord and Father. Run from these as you would from every vile and unclean thing, and separate yourselves unto me alone. I will not tarry. My reward is with me. Wait upon me, saith the Lord God of hosts. Now, for her to get that 15 minutes before, I tend to pay attention to it, and I will be posting it on my website. But what Tom just laid out, and I'm turning it over to him. Tom, take your liberty and your time. The bottom line is what he just laid out about the coming persecution, the clergy response teams that the DHS has already put into place are but the beginning of the slaughter. And again, I'm going to say this one more time. Those of you who continue to resist, those of us who are trying to win souls by calling us into question, mocking, accusing, uh, 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 calling us doom porn, the Lord God of heaven rebuke you, and you will have your comeuppance, and I don't believe it's going to be long. You need to repent, because if you're not for the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you're standing against those who are bringing people to Jesus, sharing the truth of God's word, and with the calling and the supernatural attestation, even when we're on this show together like Tom and I, shame on you. The Lord God of heaven rebuke you. Go ahead, Tom. Well, Steve, I, you know, obviously there are those now, and that, and it is growing, and it's going to continue to grow. Um, in fact, I can tell you that every leader, every Christian leader that I respect and with whom I am associated with in news, print, television, social media, all of them have been under uh, a growing, unprecedented attack the last few years, and not from those that the world would expect. In other words, religious Christians, not unbelievers per se, form the largest part of the swelling ranks of warfare that's being aimed now at silent, uh, well, trying to silence our work. Because, um, well, the discontents, they can't stop people from hearing our voices, and that infuriates the spirits behind them. <laughs> I don't mean to be offensive here, but it does. And so at a minimum, they seek to divide, to confuse. But what are they really trying to do? They're trying to unground babes in Christ, that while they're out there seeking a deeper relationship with Jesus, they wind up online. And there are those who would destabilize those believers. And and by the way, these people have always existed I mean, I, I witnessed ingrates in every town where I ever pastored for 30 years throughout the 70s to the 90s. 
The difference today is that the Internet has given malcontents a place to hive and to hide behind computer screens but they use these spiritual sounding titles and websites right they give them they give themselves these names that makes it sound like they're defenders of the faith so that they can use it to unleash their ungraciousness against people that are really out here doing the work of the ministry and i i don't hesitate to phrase it in that kind of language now i'm happy that their audiences right now are really small I've had Donna uh, go and, you know, she knows about technology. I don't. I'm just an old preacher, old fat preacher, right? But, <clears throat> I'll, you know, a, a couple times in my life I've said, okay, these people are attacking us, but I want you to go and tell me how many clicks do they get on their websites per day. And, and it's basically non-existent. They get 10, 15 people. They're all just clicking their own websites. So, they 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 don't have any audience at the time, but that's not really the issue. Their contaminated spirit threatens uh, to take root on the Internet, and at some point, when the timing is right, it's going to explode under the coming legions that are going to fuel the empire of the son of perdition. That's really the issue. Um, but But every solid Bible expositor I know right now, is being tirelessly harassed online by these uh, fake defenders of the faith. Um, but it's not that they're. It, it's not hard to determine that they're not members of the body of Christ. They don't belong to Jesus. How do I say that? Because not once have these self-proclaimed guardians of the truth actually followed the Bible's mandates, the New Testament mandates that very specifically outline how believers are to deal with one another when there is error in the church. The New Testament books, Matthew, Galatians, Thessalonians, Romans, all of these provide very specific details, guidelines, for dealing with differences between true believers. And what these verses teach us is that if we perceive a brother or sister, as falling into error, what does it say we are to do? We are to go to them privately, underline the word privately, in a spirit of humility and redemption. If they won't receive our advice, then we go to the elders of the church privately, and we share our concerns. If the elders believe that the issue is legitimate, they go to that person privately in hopes of restoring them. If that person still refuses counsel, the church is just to have nothing more to do with them. So with that in mind, the next time any of the people that are listening to this show, the next time you're out there online reading some diatribe about Steve Quayle or Chuck Missler or Gary Stearman or David Flynn or J.R. Church or L.A. Marzulli or Chris Putnam or Jonathan Kahn or Tom Horn or any of the other current favorite targets, Ask yourself this one very simple Bible-based New Testament book of Acts uh, and, and uh, Pauline epistle question. Did these hatchet people that are attacking them, did they ever bother to obey the Scripture themselves and go to these people privately and share their concerns in a loving spirit of restoration? Well, I can tell you they haven't. They never have. Uh, and then be careful, little eyes, what you read because destructive forces – are out there. They're seeking to contaminate your mind, your spirit, your soul. Go and read Proverbs chapter 4, specifically 23 to, through uh, 27, and, and see what it tells you about what you need to guard your mind, your heart, your soul against these malcontents, this dark side. And also be clear about this. Absolutely nothing in the Scripture, nothing, zero, nada, allows for setting up a website or a blog or other medium to publicly and routinely lambast believers with accusations. Listen, folks, that's the job of Satan and his followers. He is the father of lies. He is the accuser of the brethren which accused them before our God day and night. Uh, John 8, uh, chapter 8, Revelation chapter 12. Simply put, the words of Jesus, that you shall know them by their fruits, Matthew 7. They've never been more important. These instructions of Christ 
have to serve uh, as a warning to all believers, especially with the uh, with the birth of the internet. Monitor your motives, examine your hearts. If truly you are altruistic, or if in fact these people are being energized by selfish ambition, because the 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 latter is that lucifer effect that we mentioned earlier today antichrist is going to use that kind of energy to infuse this coming war between christian versus christian a time when it's going to be eternally important that you know what side you are you are on so all i would say steve is there's always going to be those who uh, uh, are going to accuse you, that are going to accuse me, and these prophets that are out there that are taking issue with them, they're doing their job. That's what prophets do. That's what a prophetic spirit is. And thank God for them. But the bottom line is, it's going to get worse and worse. The latter-day churchgoer is soon going to believe that they, are, according to the Scripture, according to the Bible, they're soon going to believe that they're serving the kingdom of God by participating in or approving the death of conservative Christians. By the way, that's not a concept that's lost on all contemporary churchmen. There are those uh, who see things right now taking shape, and I'm talking about internationally known people, that see things taking shape for a war that is eventually going to pit religious Christians against the real members of the body of Christ. I'll give you an example. And I, for for that matter, I don't know if he's a Christian, but I want to talk about a letter he received. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, early this year, 2014, a couple months ago, he wrote that modern Christians are going to soon be called to suffer and to even die, he said, for their faith in a new era of martyr, martyrdom. But what most of the public don't know is why he said that. There was a document that he received. It wasn't supposed to be made public, but we at Raiders News Update got our copy of it. We got our hands on it. It was authored by a senior advisor to Welby's predecessor, but it details how there is a time of great persecution that is coming. Why? Very specifically, it says, because true believers soon according to this study, are going to be driven underground by liberal Christians, and they are going to become a dissident association, I'm quoting now, comparable to resistance movements during World War II, end quote. That's a document that was provided uh, to Welby. Um, now, it's interesting because recall that um, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, one of America's most beloved Bible teachers of the past century, right? He taught the same thing. He, he said that true biblical believers would ultimately be driven underground by who? He said by none other than latter-day denominational churches. Another of the 20th century's most perceptive writers, A.W. Tozer. I'm sure you've read, you've read many of his books, right, Steve? Yes, sir. And, and Tozer, as you know, he was really careful. Uh, he was never given to prophecy, to prognostication, that kind of thing. But the day came when he wrote this, quote, Let me go out on a limb a little bit and prophesy. I see the time coming when all of the holy men, whose eyes have been opened by the Holy Spirit, will desert worldly evangelicalism one by one. The house, institutional Christianity, will be left desolate, and there will not be a man of God, a man in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, left among them, end quote. So, in the very near future, according to these men of God, there's going to be Holy Spirit devoid church attenders, and they're going to join religious types to constitute Antichrist, apostate religious political order. Mystery Babylon, right? In Revelation chapter 17. And as unfathomable Absolutely. as it sound to some of the people that are listening to this show, they are going to formulate perhaps the most egregious rank among the man of sin's Gestapo members in their appetite for destroying latter-day truly born-again believers. We're probably not going to have time during the show tonight to talk about the Stanford Prison Experiment, the Milgram Experiment, but it does say something about the heart of humanity and that when people 
are put in the right kind of social situation, and especially when they have a um, either a fearsome or a respected authority figure, it is astonishing what people would be willing to do, the depths to which the average good neighbor would be willing to stoop in the persecution of other individuals giving the right kind of social phenomena, uh, which is it's be- basically being baked in the oven as I speak. Uh, yeah, Steve and this is rel- Hey, Doug. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, 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 no you I, go yeah. ahead. Uh, all right, Steve. With what uh, Tom was saying about the Milgram experiment, you know, I noticed in your book uh, Xenogenesis, you touched on the the hypnotic. Uh, Effect or, or the larger effect, for example, uh, well-spoken orators like Hitler had on masses of people, and, and I think that 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 what we're seeing today, um, and and I had uh, broken the story about the uh, from my DHS source where Obama had uh, uh, people, uh, uh, cyber warriors basically, uh, engaging cyber warriors in attacks on people on the internet to marginalize, vilify, nullify their message, and what have you. And all of this kind of combines together what we're talking about tonight with with uh, Tom Horn's work, uh, his uh, work white papers as well as Exo Vaticana and others, and your work Xenogenesis. But uh, but uh, uh, Tom, I, I think if you can just take a few seconds, if you, Steve, with your um, indulgence, if you don't mind, uh, uh, talk about the Milgram, Milgram experiments because I, I do believe that this is a really uh, important aspect of what we're seeing: uh, attacks, internal attacks. From uh, against people like uh, like you, Steve and, and Tom and, and others, I think this is key here. Do you mind? Well, Can we do that? Yeah. Well, sure, Doug. And and first of all, um, you mentioned Hitler, and what I would say to those who doubt um, that a war is coming that will pit religious Christians against conservative uh, Christians that will ultimately lead to the death of so many. Think back of the trainloads of Jews who vanish beneath the brutality of Nazi Germany, but do not forget that those, by the millions, those who participated in their destruction, maintained a Protestant faith. Um, Don't forget that hundreds of thousands of men, women and children, that have died since the days of Christ's crucifixion, the martyrdom of his disciples, at the hands of what? Institutional church authorities, holy temple leaders. And that's been a fact throughout history. The European wars of religion, um, the Muslim conquests, the Crusades, the Spanish Reconquista, the Ottoman wars in Europe, the Inquisition of the Roman Catholic Church, all of those are lessons from history that tell us that within religious people, not just people, very, very religious people, is um, something. It exists within them. It's within the human heart to participate in a program that would ultimately lead to the destruction of other individuals. Now, I mentioned the Stanford Human, I mean, I mean the Stanford University experiment, which we won't take time to go into. It it was ten years after the what's called the Milgram experiment. This was in the nineteen early nineteen sixties, nineteen sixty one, I believe. And this is an experiment that's been repeated uh, throughout numerous societies in different kind of scenarios, but always with the same kind of consistent results. And what it did, the Milgram experiment, what it did, it measured the willingness of participants to obey authority figures who order them to go against what we would expect as restrictions of human consciousness in performing acts of cruelty against other study participants. That was the idea. And these tests, they they began at Yale University in the 1960s under the psychologist Stanley Milgram, uh, and that's where it got its name from. And the reason they did at that time, again to Nazi Germany, this was something like three or four months into the trial of Nazi war criminal uh, Otto Adolf Eichmann the German Nazi colonel, right, that was deemed so highly responsible for organizing uh, the Holocaust. And Milgram had designed a test to try to answer a burning question that was, people, that was on people's minds back then, and that was, could it be that Eichmann 
and his million accomplices in the Holocaust were just simply following orders? Were they just simply following orders? Is there some psychological um, situation, some scenario in which people would go against otherwise what their consciousness might tell them because they're following orders? Well, Milgram came to believe that that, that was true and that the essence of obedience, what the what the followers of Hitler were doing, consisted in the fact that a person can come to view themselves as the instrument for carrying out another person's wishes, and therefore they no longer regard themselves as being responsible for their actions. So what Milgram did, to try to answer this question that was on everybody's mind during the trial of Adolf, he um he went in he created a laboratory uh and he did it in the context of a learning experiment uh um and he got uh, two different people he got well he actually got three but only one was a true volunteer one was in on the gig who was called the experimentor the other one was also in on the gig that was an actor um and then there was uh, one person who was, um, they called him the teacher. And the, and the teacher was um, not in on the ruse. This was a real volunteer. And what they were told was, okay, the experimenter um, wants you to ask particular questions of the learner. And if the learner gets it wrong, you are to push a button that's going to electrically shock the learner. And the more questions they get wrong, you're going to increase the level at which you are shocking the learner. And But you have to follow the advice of the experimenter. That's the authority figure, right? So um, the authority figure, the experimenter, orders the teacher, the subject of the experiment, the only one who's really a volunteer and doesn't really know that it's just a ruse, to give what they believe to be painful electrical shocks to the learner who's in another room, and it's an actor. And so the, the, the experimenter says, ask this question. So the, um, the teacher asks a particular question. When the actor, who's pretending to be a volunteer, gets it wrong, the teacher is to push a button. And they, and they turn up the volume each time, all the way up, by the way, all the way up to 450 volts of electricity. Now here's what's amazing about this finding was the Milgram experiment showed that 65% of all volunteers, including women, were willing to administer the final massive 450-volt electrical shock to this person that's in the other room screaming in agony because the authority figure told them to do so. Even though it was obvious it was going against their own conscience because the some of the people who were uh, the teachers, the, the, the only person really not in on the gig, they were sweating, they're trembling, they're biting their lips. These are all from the records of Milgram. They're digging their fingernails into their own skin. They're laughing nervously. But in the end, they did it anyway because the authority figure told them to. And this tells us something about human nature. Now, when there were some criti criticisms that were made in opposition to Milgram following his original study, I love what he said. He said that I have received criticism uh, because people did not like the fact that we unveiled something very disturbing, something unwelcome about human nature. And then he summarized those findings. Uh, in fact, there's an article out there you can go and read called The Perils of Obedience. Uh, in which he talks about how authority figures. Now, think of that in the context of Bible prophecy and the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to be the ultimate authority figure. And just imagine uh, how people who have rejected true Christianity are going to be willing to torture to the point of death born-again believers because they have this ultimate authority figure, the Antichrist, and the ultimate authority figure in the false prophet, this false leader of the megachurch that's coming, telling them that this is what they're supposed to do because these people like Tom Horn and Steve Quayle and the Hagmans, they're standing in the road of progress. They're keeping us from eternal salvation through genetic alteration. These people simply have to be done away with, as that one article at the uh, science 
magazine that I quoted earlier said that you know these are these people are murderers. They're killing us. They're keeping us from eternal salvation. So uh, I would encourage people because we'll run out of time tonight. We can't talk about the Stanford experiment, which was similar to the Milgram experiment. Go to Wikipedia or go to Google. Look up the Stanford Prison experiment. Look up the Milgram experiment. Read all of the details because I'm only going very quickly over all of that. Um, but it is amazing how, in fact, Philip uh, Zombardo, by the way, you might not know this, Doug, Philip Zombardo, who was the original professor, you know, at the Stanford Prison Experiments, right. he, testifi- he testified at the uh, Abu Ghraib trial of that one, um, uh, well, I forget exactly what his name was, but the, the, the Marine who was uh, persec- was prosecuted and found guilty of misusing some of the people there at the Abu Ghraib prison. He testified uh, of the Lucifer effect there on behalf of that guy and said that he was basically, he did wrong, he ought to be tried, but you have to keep in mind that he was also a victim of the circumstances around him that created this Lucifer effect. But he also talks about the Milgram trials, and Zimbardo reveals that none of the few participants um, during the Milgram trials that refused to administer the final shocks at in the test, none of them had insisted that the experiment itself be shut down. They just didn't do it, and they left. And when they were finished with their participation, not one of them bothered to even go check the health of the victim that they believed was potentially severely traumatized or maybe even killed as a result of that experiment. And a few, uh, by the way, just a few years ago, uh, there's a researchers um, by the name of Charles uh, Sheridan and Richard King, and they speculated that some of the Milgram experiment volunteers in the role of the teacher might have suspected that their victim was faking the trauma, the actor, uh, and so that's why they went along with it. So what Charles Sheridan and Richard King did, they set up a similar trial using a cute, fluffy puppy, which obviously would not know how to fake it, right? And in that case, the electrical shocks were actually real, albeit unknown to the participants. They were harmless. But their findings were even more astonishing. They're published. People can read them. They're in the Obedience to Authority with an Authentic Victim Report, reported during the proceedings of the 80th Annual Convention of the American Psychological Association. And what's astonishing, not only did they verify Milgram's conclusion, uh, in, uh, that were done in the Yale University experiments. Um, but they they also showed that people like at Yale, they showed high levels of distress during the ordeal, and yet 50% of the male subjects, and get this, 100% of the females, 100%, obeyed the authority figured and continued to electrocute a cute, fluffy little puppy until the end, even though they believed it was going to kill the puppy. So, not to be redundant, but again, what could this kind of research suggest that the majority of people will be willing to do when the utmost fearsome authority figure ever to walk planet Earth arrives, a time when Jesus said that people's hearts are going to fail them for fear for seeing those things that are coming upon the Earth, and he arrives and he begins ordering his followers to kill all who are not going to accept his leadership. Um, I'm telling you, a war is coming, and there's both secular and religious, theological and prophetic reasons uh, to believe that it's coming. It's the most forgotten aspect of Bible prophecy. But what you're seeing right now, and I saw an article uh, on the Internet the other day. It was called the post-traumatic church syndrome. I don't know if you saw that. Um, but it, but it, But it illustrates that there are those who, for whatever reason, man, they just don't feel comfortable in the modern church, and they're leaving, and they're going into their homes, and they're starting their own church. And by the way, I see that as a very positive thing. Um, In fact, I think at the end of the Lucifer effect, the light at the end of the Lucifer effect tunnel could be a really good thing, Um, a a lead-out to a period in history when true believers, they're going to be thoroughly persecuted, um, like J. Vernon McGee preached, about denominational uh, churches, but 
people meeting in small groups and homes during the week, rediscovering the Bible, enjoying this more intimate fellowship than they can find in a, in a Sunday church, um, that's actually describing Christianity as it was first known in the book of Acts. So there will be some good that is coming out of this turmoil that's developing right now, but people had better wrap their heads around the fact that what's happening in the social divide and genetic modification. Uh, again, let me just tell people, if you, if you want the book, Exo Vaticana, that deals with this subject, I'm going to give it to you free. If you buy Cauldron, we'll give you the blood moons are here and David Flynn's temple at the center of time, all of that. Exo Vaticana too, and then take the money that you save. You're going to save 65 bucks. So now you got the money. Go to stevequail.com. Get this book. Don't make no excuses about it. Xenogenesis, Changing Men into Monsters. You need to get the book. Oh, and you need to type in, I heard you on Hagman at uh, SurvivorMall.com, or they won't have any idea what you're talking about. Thank you, Tom. Go ahead, Steve. We're at the point now, Doug, where everything is in motion, everything is in play. It's not waiting for it to happen. By the way, I want to make it clear to everyone, I love men of God who are in the pulpits preaching the Word of God. I believe that the best uh, presentation is where the Word of God is honored. You know, I have PowerPoints, but I felt like even on the coming uh, Whitestone Conference, the Lord said, Steve, he said, who taught you what you have learned? I said, Derek Prince and other men and, and, and some women you brought into my life. He said, I don't want you to go to the tech now. I'm not downing on anybody that uses it. I'm just telling you this. I had such a check in my spirit. Jesus, uh, you know, basically, he gets my attention very clearly, Doug. And thank God for all the intercessors. Or I'd be dumber than a box of rocks but by his grace and his calling. I, he gets my attention, but he said, I do not want you, Steve, and this is, applies to me, no one else, to do anything but pr teach what I've given you, your understanding for, out of my word. For I must once again, how does this sound, Tom? This is what the Lord spoke to me today. Get my people to turn their eyes away from the gimmicks and turn their eyes onto my word. Now, see, I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, uh, a technophobe or anything, but I, I've noticed something, that when, when I was growing up in, in Pentecost, after I'd had my encounter with Jesus, which people criticized me, well, why would he choose you? That's a good question to ask him. I don't know. But I know that he did. And the bottom line is, is I remember that people showed up in churches with Bibles, that the pastor would say, go to this text. You were a pastor. I was one for a year. Thank God the Lord freed me from something I should have never been. Thank God. Oh, Jesus, thank you so much. You know, I'm not, a, I, look, I know what a pastor is. I'm not a pastor. But I do know what a teacher is, and I do know, obviously, the difference, you know. But the point that I'm trying to make in all this is simply this. It's turn your eyes upon Jesus' time. I don't need any more entertainment. And by the way, I'm surprised that, and I forget the name, and I'm not picking on the guy, but I did post on my website where a Hillsong Ministries, a head pastor there, just came out and endorsed Chrislam. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, it's Islam that's slaughtering people. It's Islam that's uh, beheading them. It's Islam that's tearing the hearts out of three-year-old girls. It's Islam that's chopping up Christians in the meat market. Even World Net Daily carried the story. I refused to carry it because it made me sick, okay? Once World Net Daily did, I posted their sanitary version. The Wally Sh or Walid Shubat version is anything but sanitary. And you know what I said, Tom? I said, dear Lord God, there is nothing in this world, seemingly, that will get the attention of the mainstream, quote, professing church in America until it's their loved ones that they're seeing lifeless. And I won't even go into the gore and the details. But, ladies and gentlemen, by their fruit ye shall know them. And, and can I tell you something? When you've made a terminal mistake, you can gain repentance, but unfortunately the church has become Samson. It has made its bed with the whores. The Delilah Factor, that would be a good name for a new book. The, I don't want to write another one. Delilah Factor, and basically it has, it has slept with the prostitutes. It has basically committed lewd acts and 
the secret of the strength of the church was in its purity based on the word of God. Now basically, like Samson, its eyes are put out, its strength is gone, and it will yield. Faith will always be persecuted by unbelief. Religion will always persecute those who are in relationship with Jesus. And I believe, like Pastor Langford said, come out from amongst them and be separate has everything to do in the spiritual realm. And you can't, you know, we're in the world, we're not of the world. But I, I, I personally will not go into another church unless the Lord specifically sends two angels and they get my attention. Because what I see is the most, I would say this, how do I say this tactfully? The most vomitous, and I'm talking about the mainstream uh, uh, devil-embracing doctrine of demons that the whole world's going after, I see that as the complete uh, antithesis to the Word of God, to the person of Jesus Christ. And, Tom, I've got to be blunt with you. My number one issue right now is the cowardice, and I'm talking now in the pulpits. I'm talking about friendship with the world is enmity with God. And look. I understand my days, your days, our days, Doug, Joe, your days, all of our days are in the live, are, are in the hands of the Lord. We have life as long as he gives us. I'm also aware of their plots, schemes, plans, blueprints, absolute, uh, uh, I would call this hyena-like appetites from hell. I am convinced that the yelping dogs are the ones professing themselves to be wise, and they become fools. And the thing is, is that when you and I, Tom, or you and I, Doug, and Joe, and David Langford, and, and Greg, and everybody that you've brought on, Doug, to your program to try and minister life, when we become attacked, that is the spirit of Antichrist. Because, listen, we're declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he shed his blood. What we're telling you is the that which will come after tonight. And, Tom, I prayed before the show just saying, Lord, Please let, let everyone who hears the show have 72 hours, because after the 72 hours is up, three days, I said, Lord, I know what comes after. I know the doubt, the mocking, the ridicule, the scorn. If you hang out with those people, you are of the same spirit. If you agree with them, then you are of the same spirit, and you will be damned with them. Someone says, well, that's not loving. Oh, yes, it is. The most loving person in the universe is he who shed his blood for us, and he said, Basically, in hell, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth where their worm dieth not. And the bottom line is the transhumanists are simply saying, guess what? We did an end run around God. You're never going to die. You don't have to worry about hell. You don't have to worry about anything because we're going to give you eternal life. We're going to give you supernatural power. We're going to give you enhanced genetics. You're going to be able to see, be smarter. We're, you are going to be the Superman of comic book fame. And in my book, Xenogenesis, I spell it out like it's never been spelled out. 400-some footnotes, I think it's 378 pages. And I will only tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, if you read that book, if you never read anything I've ever written, ask the Lord, should I read this? Because this is the sum total of 43 years of the, of the living God's mercy in my life. And, and there are so many times, Tom, I've just said, Lord, I'm washing my hands of these people that call themselves Christians. And the Lord simply said, what, you, what makes you think, Steve? They're my followers. Well, obviously that means I've got to keep the stuff on my hands and keep doing what he's called me to do. Uh, so the bottom line is, is that we're down to the last three minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, I would tell you this. When Tom and Chris wrote Exo Vaticana, the world was amazed that they knew what they knew. Oh, a lot of people send me emails, and what they were just telling you, look, they're, they're quoting Catholic uh, 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 prophets. They're quoting Catholic historians, theologians. And, Tom, when you broke the news, and it blew my mind about what went on at Mount Graham when you and Chris went there, to me, that is another one of those things. You blew my mind the first time on the gates of hell wouldn't prevail. That's what the Lord, but I, it, listen, in that one statement, it all came together for me. So, Tom, bless you. I thank you for that. And, and, ladies and gentlemen, take Tom up on the offer. The bottom line is he provides on Raiders News Update. That's the one that I go to in the morning, I, you know, with his permission. Some of the stuff that he finds, I don't know how he finds it, but we're in this together to bring to you the most amazing tapestry of divine warning, protection, provision, 
presence and salvation and the one P word that the world is so frightened of, and that's the power of the blood of Jesus. So good night, ladies and gentlemen. Tom, bless you. Thank you. Again, uh, we just basically had a three-hour introduction. Doug, thank you so much for your graciousness. (laughs) The Lord bless you. Joe, bless you. By the way, I'll send you another book. You have to fight Doug for it. So the point is, is that in in all things, in all things, we give thanks. For this is the will of Christ Jesus concerning us, and Jesus is Lord, and he never will fail us. I can tell you this. I failed him 8,465,000 times. He's never failed me once. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tom. God bless you guys. Have a great night. Great show. Till tomorrow night, everyone. With Brother Marcus and Augusto Perez will be with us. Have a stay safe and we'll see you then. Good night.